So we'll be starting momentarily. Ross will be starting soon. We have to get the screens oriented for the public. Okay, I'm here. We're, we're working on technical difficulties, for, not difficulties, but Julian is doing his thing. She needs some rubber shell shoes. <laughs> I'm going to call to order the, what's the date, the 14th, I think, um, Environmental Matters Committee meeting. And uh, for the record, um, Alderwoman Finlayson and uh, myself are present, and Alderman Arnett is virtual. So, do I have a motion about, I guess, acknowledging the virtual tenants of Alderman Arnett? I will make the motion that we accept Alderman Arnett's uh, presence virtually. <laughs> All right, I'll second that, I, I think. You know, <laughs> all those in favor? Vote you in. <laughs> Please say aye. 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 All right, so if, as far as the agenda, we have a couple adjustments. Uh, Mr. Chair, I will move approval of the agenda with the exclusions of ID 17022, uh, the Conservancy Board presentation, and R3222, the Chesapeake Bay Trust and the City of Annapolis Watershed Restoration Grant Program. And I would like to add to the agenda uh, the oil spill and Rocky Gorge. Thank you. Uh, I will second Mr. that. Chair, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Yes. Can, can we also add, to the, we also add to the agenda uh, the, uh, recontinuing the recontinuing of the updates from planning, planning and zoning? Yes. That spreadsheet yes. that we were supposed to get? Yes. So I will add that to... Um, we have that on the agenda for September. Okay. Because we wanted to... Um, I wasn't sure if plan is only was prepared to do that for today. If that works. Yes, thank you. Yes. On that? Okay. I don't know where to look <laughs> for him. All right. Uh, all those in favor of the modified agenda, please say aye. 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 All right. Motion carries. Next up for business and miscellaneous, we have an approval of minutes from June 22nd. Uh, Moval approval of the minutes. Second. Uh, all right. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. And we're going to proceed first up with a presentation on, uh, from a guest who wanted to talk to us about Greenberry Point and the proposed golf course. Is, is there someone here to talk about the Greenberry Point? All right. You can come on up to um, the podium or the table, whichever you prefer. Oh, you're just doing public. Okay, is there anybody else to talk about? All right, come on up, Mr. Olive. Uh, just state your name and address, please. Yeah, my name is Jesse. And turn on the mic. Uh, my name is Jesse Iliff. I live at 107 Gardner Drive in Annapolis. Um, 
here representing the Severn River Association where I'm executive director. Uh, the Greenbury Point currently is a forested and wetland covered area that serves as vital habitat for a number of species uh, of flora and fauna, a carbon sink, and uh, an excellent area for recreation for people to walk, run, fish, picnic, and otherwise enjoy the passive recreation um, nature of the site. It is one of the few remaining areas in the central part of our county that is on the water and publicly accessible to everybody, uh, at least during certain times. And it is uh, an environmental amenity that should be preserved. I know that the city is aware, as many are, that there's been a proposal to redevelop the area as a golf course that's been submitted by the Naval Academy Golf Association, which is a nonprofit organization affiliated uh, with the Naval Academy. And it has put that proposal before the Secretary of the Navy. Unfortunately, there are three significant problems with this proposal that we see. The first is environmental. Um, the area, as I mentioned, has environmental benefits now that would be lost if a golf course were placed there, not only because of the danger from developing it in the first place, but also because of the continued use of fertilizers and pesticides to maintain the golf course in perpetuity. The second area of concern is the loss of general public access, which is currently enjoyed by a wide swath of people from all walks of life and the conversion to a golf course would make it limited to only those who are permitted to play there, which our understanding is would be limited to service members, veterans, um, and their families, not to mention being very expensive, so there's uh, an equity consideration there as well. And then the third problem with this proposal so far has been the transparency of it, which has been sorely lacking. In our open government society, it is the norm and the expectation that when a public amenity is proposed for some sort of different use or uh, redevelopment, that the proposal should be vetted by the community and reviewed by all the people, all the stakeholders involved. And in this case, it seems that that process has been reversed and the proposal has been advanced to the highest echelons of the of the Navy before even being vetted amongst community members. And so for those three main reasons, uh, we hope that the city council will utilize whatever power it has to try and bring transparency to this process and engage as many people uh, as possible in its review and consideration, especially considering its proximity just across the Severn River from downtown and how many Annapolis residents uh, and citizens use the area currently and considering that should the proposal advance as, uh, it, has, as it has been articulated so far that that use would be cut off. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Iliff. May I ask a question, yes, Mr. Iliff? Yeah. Um, what steps have you taken to try to get to the highest level of the federal government where the Department of the Navy resides. Have you had an opportunity to uh, speak to the county or even to uh, a state um, agency that might be able to help also? Well, at, when, when you say you, I'm going to assume that you mean me as Severn River Association. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we have requested and had meetings with the staff of most of our federal delegation who, whose districts mm -hmm. co cover the area. So um, we've spoken with Senators Cardin and Van Hollen's staff, Senator Anthony Brown's staff, uh, and Senator Dutch Ruppersberger's staff haven't been able to reach Sarbanes yet. Um, to express our concerns, we've also uh, joined a letter with the Chesapeake Conservancy writing to um, the Secretary of the Navy to express some of these concerns, but it was only just recently in response to a Freedom of Information Act request that was filed in February that we received uh, 
one letter from the president of the Naval Academy Golf Association, Chet Gladchuk, to the sec to Secretary Del Toro and the Navy, and um, one of the the Navy, one of the secretary's staffers responded basically saying, "You shouldn't have sent this here. You should go through the um, naval support activity at Annapolis, which is the entity that." owns the property and would issue the lease that's being requested as a sole source lease for this project. Um, so we have reached out to officials within Department of Defense and to our federally elected representatives. We have mentioned this to some of our state elected representatives, but the feeling seems to be that since this is a federal enclave, the, the jurisdiction doesn't really extend to to this property. And so while some of our state representatives may be supportive, for instance, the whole peninsula is located in the Chesapeake Bay critical area. So generally, um, the Department of Natural Resources would have jurisdiction to uh, the critical area commission within the DNR would have jurisdiction to review proposals for development in that sort of an area. But because it's a federal enclave, it seems to sort of trump that uh, that authority. Thank you. I, I think it's important for us to understand what has been done. Um, and I have a feeling the mayor um, is going to want to join you. And I shouldn't speak for him, but. No, yeah, I, I, I believe that may be the case. I mean, we certainly have brought it to Mayor Buckley's attention. Um, and uh, I, I've the Severn River Association has been working in concert with the Chesapeake Conservancy throughout most of this. And more recently, uh, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation has also joined in our calls for greater transparency. I mean, just based off of what we know right now, I'm fairly confident that we would oppose this idea. Uh, but a lot of folks want to see, well, what is the exact plan? Where is the footprint? Where is you know, the proposal for the fairways and the sand traps and so forth, but none of that has been made public. Although the letter that we did receive through a FOIA request indicates that there has been some of that planning done, um, those documents haven't been made public yet. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, are there any other comments on Greenberry Point? Hello, my name is uh, Randy Rowell, and I'm just making a comment. I'm speaking about this later during my uh, presentation for my, my update from the commission, Environmental Commission. But as a member of uh, Mulberry Hill, which is adjacent to Greenberry Point Road, which is where the uh, bird refuge exists um, in the Naval Academy Golf Course, that's where I grew up at um, my whole life. And uh, it is a predominantly black community. Um, and so I represent a number of organizations that do work in that area um, and grassroots organizations and wanted to, you know, put on the record that it's something that also to be considered uh, a sense of reconciliation or, uh, for the previous uh, activities that, you know, the Naval Academy has done uh, in regards to placement of workers and things like that. And um, so I, I just want to say that it's, it's an area that has a lot of rich history. And uh, along with this possible renovation brings about other discussions about equity and access and things like that. Um, so it's something to think about. May I ask a yes. question? Uh, Mr. Rao, um, do you know whether, you know, there are what, three or four communities, you mentioned Browns Woods and Mulberry Hill, and there are several others. Uh, are there organizations within each that might be interested in signing on to a letter to share the concerns by the community? Sure, I could see that, yeah. And there's a number of organizations. Uh, mm -hmm. Just for example, Mulberry Hill uh, Community Association, my, my father, Randy Brow Sr., he's the president of that. Mm -hmm. um, and usually what happens in places like David Taylor Center, when they wanted to do some development, they seek the community's input on that. Mm -hmm. So um, I believe that that's a requirement. <laughs> um, so those neighboring communities, um, they have to have a say in that. 
And uh, the Naval Academy golf course was actually my first job I ever held at 15. <laughs> Uh, so I have a very close relationship with that site. So, um, but there, there's definitely some environmental concerns there. Uh, Bill O'Leary on our commission has done a very extensive report on that, and uh, any of that info we welcome to share as well. Thank you. Right. Anybody else? Hi. My name is Sue Steinberg. I am a co-founder of the Facebook page, Save Greenberry Point. We have almost 2,000 followers in less than um, just a few months. We have a petition with over 3,000 signatures opposing this golf course. Can you please give your uh, address? Uh, 2129 Hideaway Court, Annapolis, Maryland. And I had to write this down because otherwise I want to make sure I cover everything. So if you don't mind, it's only about a couple minutes. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. Public speaking is not my strength, but standing on a soapbox for a passion is. When the most horrible pandemic hit our country in 2020, I was looking for something or some place that made sense. Myself and many others gravitated towards Greenberry Point to find something beautiful in this crazy world and find some fresh air and clear our head. I was in awe of the raw nature and the water views overlooking Annapolis and the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. More importantly, and oddly enough, over the first months of the pandemic, I found a passion for nature. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but I also found a passion for birding. It really is true what they say about the closer you look at nature, the closer it looks at you. I'm fortunate to have people in my life that enjoy the outdoors and hiking and have been given the appreciation for the great outdoors. People in my life have reminded me that we have been destroying this planet long enough. It is time now to start reversing that trend. Without clean air and water, we will perish. So it's more important than ever to that we take a stand. I have met the nicest people on the trails of Greenberry Point. The stories will break your heart, but you will also have a greater understanding of people and their needs for a place of refuge. Whether it's a death in the family or just need to get away from the kids for a few hours or just get that runner's high it's a very important part of their day. The wildlife, the pollinators, the indigo buntings, the goldfinch, the hundreds of other birds that migrate here and nest here is worth saving. It makes sense why this was made a conservation area years ago. The habitat is such that a bobwhite actually came back after 11 years. Why would anyone spend all that money creating this wonderful habitat only to destroy it and put another 18-hole golf course here? How could you even play golf on a course knowing that you destroyed habitat for wildlife and you're polluting the Chesapeake Bay? Are we that short-sighted? I would like to think we're not and that preservation is more important than reservations. Annapolis is what it is today because someone had the foresight to preserve it. Please don't displace all the hikers, bikers, joggers, dog walkers, birders, and photographers so that the elite few can play golf under the towers here. It would be an environmental sin. In dark times, there are opportunities, and that is what I'd like to see happen at the peninsula. I would like for it to become maybe a nature research center. We have documented over 500 species on the peninsula, and we're just getting started. Nature is thriving here, and it would be an excellent place for people to come from all over the country and get a closer look at nature and the way it thrives. We spend $10 billion on a telescope to look at the farthest reaches of space. And that's inspiring, but what else is inspiring is to really take a close look at nature and see how we can work together with nature in the future to save our planet. I'm here today to ask City of Annapolis for a resolution opposing another pesticide-infused private golf course for the elite. We already have one. Thank you for your time, and may God save our planet. Thank if, you for your testimony. Do you have any questions? <laughs> uh, any questions? All right, yes. I think we will, well, speaking for myself, I am uh, inclined to, to uh, look to pass some kind of resolution, introduce some kind of resolution. I'll um, speak with the mayor when he gets back, and we can talk as a committee if we want to see if we want to pursue anything. And since this is right across from us, and... Um, uh, have a lot of residents who use the, the point. All right, so 
Thank you again. And moving on to the next item, I'd like to invite up uh, Fire Department and OEM to talk about the um, fuel spill in Spot Creek. I think they have some good news to share. And this was, I guess if somebody could just give some background about, for those who may not be aware, what exactly happened and how much fuel it was and the extent of the spill. Sure, Doug Romali, Fire Chief. Uh, with me is Battalion Chief Wayne Fredder, who was the incident commander that night. But if I could, just before we, uh, we get into this, I'll pass it over to him. I just wanted to give you a quick update of our last meeting also about the PFOS and the firefighting foam. Um, with your help and your guidance, we were able to dispose of all that properly. We had a company come in, so that firefighting foam is gone. Uh, it's out of all the tanks. So I just wanted to give you that quick update before I turn it over Thank to you. Chief Frederick. Good afternoon. Uh, give me just one second. I'm pulling up my notes here. Um, <laughs> Watch this. And while you're looking that up, so oh, you're going. Sunday afternoon, approximately quarter to seven in the evening, the Annapolis Fire Department was alerted for a hazardous spill in the Spa Creek waterway. Uh, our Marine Division and some land assets responded, and we found a copious amount of what we believe was red, red dyed um, diesel fuel in the um, uh, in Spa Creek closest to Acting Cove. Uh, the way the wind direction was blowing, um, fortunately, it, it did collect in the Acting Cove area. Uh, we did make the resource request for MDE and the Coast Guard to respond. Uh, both of those assets were able to uh, respond by land and make a physical assessment. Um, our marine assets as well as the harbor master assets that were on the on the water started doing vessel checks from basically the Eastport Bridge towards Acton, Acted, Acted Cove, uh, searching to try to find for a source. We were never, never able to find a confirmed source of the fuel. Uh, residents around the neighborhood uh, had talked about they had gone to dinner earlier in the evening that this potential issue was going on for about three to four hours actually before the fire department was, at, was notified. And I don't remember or recall how we got the initial call from the dispatch center. Um, MDE arrived. Uh, we gave them a, a update. Uh, the initial spot where we were looking at, um, I set up the command post at the bottom of Conduit Street uh, and was out on the docks there. Um, the, the red dye portion at that point in time was between, I guess, Market Street and Conduit, Conduit Street uh, in the COVID that um, when we, on our arrival. By the time MDE arrived, the majority of it through the tide and through the wind had push past uh, Conduit Street and more into the cove. So the second uh, representative from MDE was able to get into um, the park there at Active Cove, Acting Cove and make an assessment that they did have a recoverable amount of fuel. Uh, what we were seeing initially up towards the Conduit Street was what they um, referred to as a breakdown of the um, diesel fuel, but nothing that was, uh, it was, um, silver it's described as a um, silver coating or, 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 or silver fuel where it had, just, had actively started breaking down the molecules were separating um, they did make the uh, notification with that um, we brought in the harbor master's uh, boat uh, just because of the depth of the water and uh, crews from our special ops team and the harbor master assisted md with getting the initial uh, absorbent um, uh, boom out and trying to contain it to the cove as much as possible. Um, within time later, the Coast Guard arrived and um, they started their process of actually, they were the ones that handle all the waterway spills and uh, soliciting a contractor to come out. Um, once they came out, they were able to provide a, a harder boom and try to isolate it deny entry a little bit further out of the cove and uh, start their 
salvage or the removal of their vac system of, of removing the fuel. So at that point in time, it was about 10 o'clock. Um, the fire department assets and MDE uh, were able to leave the scene and Coast Guard took over the scene. Um, a couple hours into it, I knew we were going to have problems with people um, smelling the diesel fuel and we were going to get calls. Actually, when on our immediate arrival, BG&E was um, also down there because they were getting calls for what everybody was re referring to as, as gas fumes. Uh, most people were telling us that they had walked down to dinner and thought that people were staining their decks and stuff like that. Like how this went unnoticeable, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, that's that's where it, it came into. Thank you. So for us, we, we get calls for fuel spills on the water all the time. And um, on the waterway, a small amount of diesel or gasoline will spread out and it looks like a big spill. Uh, but this incident here was actually a, a large spill that we don't typically see here in the city of Annapolis. Uh, the Coast Guard also, and I talked to the incident commander from Coast Guard, uh, they also said the same thing, that this is unusual for us to have this size of a spill uh, in the waterways in the city. So like uh, the chief said, we, we had turned it over to Coast Guard because they were the ones that would do the recovery and they actually uh, were working with a contractor. And I know that emergency management has more to tell you about that because th they recovered a significant amount of fuel out of the waterways. Now, Chief, I don't know if uh, we're, did you all have any wildlife that was affected? Uh, the, the, fireboat crew, the fireboat crew did um, tell me there were three to four ducklings uh, they found uh, closer to the Boucher Avenue side where the uh, new marina area is being built um, that it looked like the diesel fuel had contaminated the coating of the ducts where they weren't um, buoyant with the natural oils on the filter with on their feathers where they basically had their heads up. So um, it's I was told it, uh, at least three ducks ended up succumbing to the um to the spill on that side alone and like i said there were ducks in and out all all over um we never saw any noticeable fish kills floating or anything at that point um but within the incident I meant, um, that's where i wanted to bring oem um we we notified oem to start doing robocalls and, and making notifications to the to the citizens to know hey we know there's a an, an odor going on and to limit traffic down there just to help us get the recovery process going and kind of just staying out of the way of um so assets were coming in they were they were large vehicles uh, so we had clear paths for them so, has, any questions from the committee um yes yes mr chair um what's the role of the harbor master in um such an incident as this so the harbor master was actually there to assist us uh, in that we uh, we did not bring our small boat the same crew that runs the small boat is our hazardous materials team who had to bring the trailer with them so uh, because of some of the sh of getting closer to shore you need a boat with less draft on it so we were able to utilize one of the harbor master boats at the time so the harbor master's goal and you'd have to talk to beth but uh, at that point was they were there to assist us and to check the waterways so that their crew was already working um, so it was it was boats that they had already had on the water they did not come in for it they were already on the water well clearly the spill came from either um, I'm guessing um, one of the fueling sites or from a vessel it, or somewhere else Director Simmons may be able to add in our D MDE originally was thinking three different mechanisms that could potentially lose that fuel construction vehicles or any vehicle that were not highway related are allowed to burn that fuel. So it could have come from a crane or bulldozer or whatever else, potentially fuel oil for residents is also that colored dye because it's not taxed basically. And then you would have uh, one of the vehicles, one of the um, uh, sailing vessels, whether it was a sailboat or a power boat or the dock itself. So um, as far as I know, and, and the director Simmons may be able to help out, but 
they initially, those were the three potential causes mm -hmm. that they were looking at. And the Coast Guard had, had been out, but the, uh, the only fueling site in the area that had diesel, I believe, is Annapolis City Marina there. Uh, and there were no indications that they could find that it actually came from the fueling site at the marina unless something else has come up since then. No, Kevin Simmons, Director of the Office of Emergency Management. I was just going to um, add that the source of the leak is unidentified at, at this point. So they're still investigating. The Coast Guard is still investigating that. So this was a five-day ordeal. It just ended officially a couple of hours ago. So what um, Chief Freder was talking about was all Sunday. And I gave you the incident summary report hot off the presses. And if you look down the bottom, um, we're going to go to Monday, July 11th. And Chris Mai from the Office of Emergency Management, our planner, was assigned to this. And he's going to talk about some of the timeline from Monday till today, about noon. Thank you, Director Simmons. Uh, Chris Mide, Office of Murray's Management Emergency Planner. So as I said, we were originally notified on Sunday when we put out our, our initial public communications and alert messages. Starting on Monday at 9 a.m., uh, we did connect with the uh, U.S. Coast Guard, and they were still on scene performing the recovery operations, and they continued. Um, we received that update, and around 1230 at that afternoon, we put out our second alert to residents and boaters, advising them to kind of, uh, you know, keep still keep clear of the area. Um, and then to also not swim into the affected waters as cleanup was underway. Um, later that afternoon, we, we spoke with the Maryland Department of Environment, and who also then provided an additional uh, situational update. Uh, they informed OAM that the scene had been considered federalized and was under uh, the Coast Guard control and under uh, the Coast Guard Incident Command, um, and they had left the scene, um, but they did uh, provide us with the public information number uh, and got us in contact with the Coast Guard. Um, so that number was made uh, made public for residents to call the, the 443-286-5520. Um, OEM pushed that notification number out at around 3.30. Um, we were given it to the city department PIOs and then um, we also uh, contacted and coordinated with the Harbor Master's office to put no swimming signs uh, in Active Cove. When speaking with the, the Maryland Department of Environment, it wasn't like an official restriction, but it was a, a recommendation that, you know, it, it kind of general common sense that you wouldn't want to swim <laughs> in the waters until cleanup was done. Um, at that time, and later that day at 4.30, uh, we, we issued our third EM alert uh, with, uh, with additional information of what was going on. Uh, moving into Tuesday, we were still monitoring the situation. Uh, that afternoon, we, we connected again with the Coast Guard and reported that by 2 o'clock that... Uh, all the, the fuel product, all the recoverable fuel product had been removed from the coats. So everything that they could vacuum up or absorb up had been. There was a residual mousse, which is basically the byproduct of what was remained from, from breaking down the fuel. Um, and that was said that that would kind of naturally flush out uh, during tidal cycles. But they, the Coast Guard was bringing in an additional contractor to help flush that out as necessary. So that was scheduled for, originally scheduled for Tuesday evening, but due to the impending storm, it got pushed back to Wednesday morning. Um, so they kind of let us know that information. Um, and again, uh, at that time, it was safe for boaters to enter the waterways as the residual moose were told did not present any threat to the environment or public health. It was about 60% water um, and would just kind of naturally dissipate uh, through the tidal cycles. So then following up Wednesday morning, uh, the contractor did come out at 6.30 to, to flush the remaining of the cove. However, uh, the moose had dissipated from the evening storm, from the previous night's storm, so no flushing was needed. Um, and then by that afternoon on Wednesday, uh, the Coast Guard kind of reported that their operations were complete and had left the scene but still monitoring. Um, there was, uh, they did report that small patches of sheen, what they call rainbow sheen, where you can kind of see a little bit, uh, was still present at the time, but that was kind of natural and would again dissipate over uh, the next few tidal cycles. Um, the Coast Guard did state that, that that sheen did not present any additional threat to the environment or public health at that time. Uh, then continuing today, um, and this morning, uh, connecting again with the Coast Guard um, and the Harbor Master's office, the Harbor Master's went out to observe the area, so no traces, visible traces of sheen or moose could be seen in the cove. Um, from that discussion and the report from the Coast Guard, uh, the Harbor Master did, we did remove the no swimming signs um, and the incident in that area uh, by the Coast Guard standards considered to have been recovered and the cleanup operations finalized. 
Excellent. Well, sounds like a very thorough response. I want to thank you all for your work on this. Uh, and it sounds like it was, for the most part, contained uh, as far as it didn't make it out of too much out of Acton Cove with the tide. Yeah, it appeared that day, and Chief Frederick can verify, but because of the way the tide and the winds were blowing, it sort of blew it right into that cove and was contained there, which actually made it a little easier for cleanup. Uh, and I don't know, did you get a total amount that they said that they pumped off? So it was reported originally around 200 gallons of diesel fuel. So it, it was a significant amount of diesel fuel that they pumped off that they believe mm -hmm. that uh, this Co fuel was. Yeah. And the Coast Guard did work with the Maryland State Police for the crash team and used their drones to observe the area to see if any fuel was further out of the cove. Um, and they did report back that it seemed it was contained in active cove. Um, and you can see from on page three of the pictures there, they kind of used the, the booms up there to help contain the water in that area as well. And do you know if anybody's reached out to the police department, our police department, um, as far as the investigation? Because I know our department has an inventory of a list of cameras and communities. I don't know if that might be useful as far as determining the original source. Not that I know of. Um, the investigation still lies with the Coast Guard, so we're waiting to hear results from them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, May I, I ask, yes. how, how will we get the final uh, result? Will the Coast Guard forward their report to you or to the chief, or how, what's the line of so authority? So we'll keep, we'll keep in touch with our allied partners that helped us out with this. And it was like one, two, three, four, five, six agencies all together. So this is one of those high risk, low frequency things that we don't see very often. So it's not like we go out and do this every day. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that they will be in touch with us, but I know we're gonna be in touch with them. Okay. Thank you. Is there anything you feel we may want to purchase or get uh, in the future to better uh, I, you know hopefully this doesn't happen and this doesn't happen very often but is there anything you wish you had that we didn't have access to so um for, from a oem standpoint we had two licensed drone pilots and we have a very very nice expensive drone but uh, since the drone pilots have moved on so i'm actually looking for um, pilot school so I can send at least two of our members so we could kind of go down there and do a aerial visual to see how big the spill was uh, early on. So Chief O'Malley, is it anything from your end that you may need? Yeah. No, we, we, uh, we have boom, well, at least the pads to put down. Uh, but for that, that size spill, that, that's a large amount that's typically beyond our capabilities, especially being on the water, and that's where the Coast Guard and Department of Environment come in. Uh, the Department of Environment actually replaces our boom and our, our pads and our absorbent. That's who we get it from. So we work with them and they replace it. Uh, so yeah, at the current time, there's there's nothing that would have, that we didn't have that would have made this incident any better. Okay. And Alderman, or, oh, go ahead. May I ask, so it sounds like we, had, we would hire out a contractor um, like the Coast Guard brought in someone to do the actual removal. So is that the... We, we would utilize the Department of the Environment who would, would do that, unless it was actually a, a city-related, it was caused by the city, we, we probably would not have to do that. The Department of the Environment or state would assist us with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you saw, this got turned over to the, the Coast Guard, and they took it over once they federalized it. Um, so the you know, Maryland Department of the Environment was able to step back at that point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Alderman Arnett, do you have any questions? Let me find my view. Uh, just, just want to give my compliments and thanks to all the staff for their work. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Teamwork. Thank you. That's right. Thank you all for coming to give us a report. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, going to move into uh, Rocky Gorge. Um, so I'd like to invite anybody who, from staff um, and also public, but staff would like to come up to the table. We have 
two microphones here for you. And I'll, before I invite you to speak, I would like to see if the public wanted to make any comments before. Anybody from the public have testimony they want to provide before they hear from the city or the committee? Ms. Hopkinson? Hello, uh, <clears throat> my name is Anastasia Hopkinson. I'm with the Annapolis Neck Peninsula Federation. I wanna just make a brief comment. I I've heard some uh, scuttlebutt that uh, there's a concern about the environmental cost um, uh, that we require of a developer increases the cost, uh, the price of a home uh, and therefore affects the uh, affordability of housing in the Annapolis area. Uh, and I uh, suggest that uh, one consider the cost of construction of new development separate from the price of new development um, because uh, the price you pay for something is uh, in, uh, totally correlated with what the market will bear. And right now we're in a market of high um, seller pricing. Uh, secondly, the um, costs that uh, environmental regulations impose upon a development are not a significant burden. Um, the costs of, like, for instance, stormwater management and um, has, uh, uh, it, the materials are commonly available and not expensive. Uh, one particular cost, you might say, is the training of the personnel which uh, who who manage the development and that right now, uh, although there is some training available, most of the personnel lack uh, significant experience in the uh, management of uh, ma matters like stormwater control. So therefore, we rely on the jurisdiction oversight, and uh, that is a cost to the uh, jurisdiction. Um, but it, it substitutes for the learning curve that developers are now going up to understand how to manage stormwater and, and the preservation of trees. So, um, but that is not a cost that is associated, that is, uh, that is a burden to the developer. It's, just, it's, it's a tax burden. So um, I, I understand the need for affordable housing. Um, Rocky Gorge is, going to be expensive in my uh, humble opinion um, but um, and it's it, but you need to separate the cost of a project which is the burden of environmental regs from the actual price that the cons home buyer will pay thank you could you state your address for the record Anastasia could you state your address oh I'm sorry uh, 1036 Harbor Drive Annapolis, Maryland. Thank you. Uh, are there any other public comments on this particular project? Hello again. My name is Randy Rowley, and I just wanted to mention we will be I will be mentioned, talking briefly about it. But the Environmental Commission is going to be reviewing this and have a report out over the next uh, few weeks, and we welcome uh, you all to come and present at or talk to us at the next environmental commission meeting if you all you all would like to do that. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Um, so just to get some basic information orientation before we get um, into this, this is just an aerial of the project. And you can actually the current one, you can actually see a lot of the tornado damage uh, to the forest over here on the side. And uh, up north here is the six sixty five. Is, is that the plan that's approved and that's being... Um... But this, the proposed development will go in here. Oh, okay. I thought you said that was the development. This would be a conservation easement. Mm -hmm. And so just to, and this is a picture just uh, what kind of cued, uh, I think some of us on this, on the way, I noticed this on the way home uh, from work and uh, noticed a big truck pulling in and out. This is a picture from, I think, Wednesday. Just zoomed in to show a little bit some of the work that's been done out there. Um, so just to 
As far as status, uh, just some basic information for the public who may not be completely aware. This project at first had approval in 2006, planned development approval from the Board of Appeals. That approval was essentially told until 2014 uh, through, I think, three pieces of legislation and um, grading building permits from 2015 and 16 were canceled by plan and zoning in 2020. A uh, new permit, grading permit was applied for on 8 4 2020, issued in June this year, and then work started also in June this year. Um, is, is that accurate? Is anything staff would like to update on that as far as the permit status? Sure, John Manassa, Chief of Code Enforcement, Department of Planning and Zoning. Uh, the one disagreement I have with you is the uh, the note there that the permits were canceled by planning and zoning. Um, that is reflected in the tracket uh, document uh, for the grading permit file and the building permit file. However, um, there may have been an error on our part to cancel that permit um, during Which permit? the both permits during um, March of 2020. The governor's executive order on COVID um, precautions and actions extended any permit that was active at that time. So, whereas we had permits on file and I think there may have been a misunderstanding on the staff's part, mine included, that these permits were ripe to be um, canceled. In reality, we didn't have the authority to cancel them at that time because of the executive orders. So those permits should and were valid permits at that point, both the building permit and the grading permit. And they did not um, expire for the entirety of the period where the COVID emergency order was in place. And subsequently, they have brought in application to modify those permits, but they were not um, canceled at that point. Well, they were canceled but you're saying you're not sure the city had the authority per the I'm not saying that I'm not sure I'm I'm sure we did not have the authority to cancel those permits so they were errantly marked canceled in track it but and under no authority did we have email as well uh, that is what the track it record reflects and the email is reflecting what track it has on file. However, like I said, those permits were uh, valid and should have remained valid. And how did you make that determination? I mean, can you share that um, executive order from the governor, you're saying? Yeah, I can. Um, and there's opinion from the Office of Law about how it um, is treated. Do you want copy? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. It's the date on it. Um, all right, well, we'll have to take a look at this, but this would be um, kind of an unprecedented. Um, um, what's the word, legal word I'm looking for as far as um, overruling a local authority. But in any case, you said the law office has taken a look at this? Correct. Well, we were dealing with lots of different uh, permits, licenses, and uh, across the board, there were many different elements that we were dealing with in planning and zoning of, you know, things like rental licenses, building permits, um, you know, just our whole, I guess, reason for existence uh, in approving uh, permits and licenses uh, was put on hold. So we had the um, 
question go before Office of Law and they weighed in on what should be extended during that emergency order. So that all permits were included, hmm. not just this particular one. May I ask a question? Is this document from the governor um, in regards to this particular project or in general? It's every project, every permit. And what was the date of the cancellation in track it, e track it of the permits? The cancellation of the building permit um, was noted in November of 2019, I think, or December of 2019. Um, and there are multiple reasons why that's incorrect. There's also um, the request for an extension came in that was appropriately timed and approved in uh, December of 2019, which was a six month extension. And that's not, that's sort of the, the beginning of when the building permit looks like it was canceled inappropriately because uh, the permit administrator at the time did not know that staff had extended that permit and marked it as expired or canceled. And the error on our part is clerical in that regard. We did not relay the message that the permit was extended to um, the permit administrator and therefore she thought that the, the, the permit had, was going to be canceled at that point and marked it that way. So that sort of error carried forward uh, until today, I believe. I, I don't think that's ever been changed from that point. So that's the building perm permit uh, BLD 17-0357. May I ask a question yes. about the permitting? Um, who's the owner of the property now? No one seems to know who the owner of the property is? We have that on the application and currently issued permit, but I don't have it right off the top of my head, no. Well, I think we need to have that information. Okay. Because my on. next question is going to be, who was the owner of the project in 2019? And who was the owner of the project in 2020? And who was the owner of the project in 2021? And who was the owner of the project in 2010? which is when this project began. <laughs> so I'm not sure who's responsible for what. I, I, I think uh, there is a big disconnect here um, on a project this size. And we don't know who the developer is of note. And I've asked that question of the director and staff. Um, we are going on um, plans and approvals in some cases that are 10 years old. So I think we should know all the specifics about this project, including who's developing it and what they're developing. You know, I understand that they're using the original plans approved by the Planning Commission in 2010. Uh, the city's changed significantly since then, and there seems to have been no effort to accommodate the community surrounding this prop property, or anybody else in the city for that matter. So we need all of the information. You know, the environmental piece is one piece of it. The connection to the community is another piece of it. I know for a fact that there was a proposal presented to the Planning Commission within the last year to provide workforce housing on this property. And those uh, folks were soundly 
rejected by staff. And now we have going back to a proposal that's 10 years old to build high-end, I assume, high-end housing because they have MPDU's uh, requests made and I guess approved. But we still don't know who's doing this development. I have a serious concern, as you can tell, I'm sure. So let's hear the answers, how we got here, where we are with this project, and what it means to the community, what it means to Mr. Rowell's community, because I think he lives right next door without any consideration for his development. I hate to think this is how we do business. Um, Alderman, just to clarify, my understanding is that the approved site plan, even if it was, I guess, 10 years ago or however long ago it was, through our records, we've seen that it hasn't lapsed. So there's no going back to a different project or going forward to a new one. It's it's the same one that, and I'm assuming it went through a public review process at the time, is still the project that's going to be carried out regardless of who the owner is. But we'll get you the up-to-date owner information. I appreciate it. And, and I find it interesting then that when we had other proposals, and I would say no less than four other companies have been in to develop this same property. And each one had something different. But there was no discussion about, nope, you only have, you can only use the one that was approved 10 years ago. That wasn't the procedure. Uh, and the developers came in with the expectation of being, to negotiate, being able to negotiate and build the product that they wanted, and in some cases, what we wanted and needed for the city. So it may be true that they are going on a plan that's 10 years old, but we haven't followed that same procedure. May I Mr. go back Chair? and just answer one? I'm sorry. So, oh, yes, Alderman Arnett. So, um, so uh, I, I remember not I remember seeing not any seeing changes any in the... In the uh, Spreadsheets uh, that we got, we got updates, updates Rock Rock for several years, several years, and now it seems now all of a sudden it's moving sudden forward. forward. We have, we have from, from some from source, source something from McLaren that is that noting that they noting can't that meet stormwater storm requirements environment. and asking and for asking an exception. For I don't know. I don't know relevance of this to what's being approved, but certainly if there's not the ability to meet stormwater management, it seems that there should not be an approved That's right. Sorry for the sound delay. Well, Alderman, I know we will get to the stormwater management questions. Um, Are there any comments specific to Alderman Arnett? Okay, so one of the things, just looking over this order real quick, um, and I think we're going to need to have more discussion about this uh, afterwards, but uh, it does state on the second page under suspension of legal time requirements, the head of each unit of state or local government may um, essentially suspend, but they said the unit head shall provide reasonable public notice of any such suspension. Um, so I think this is, just looking at this, it looks like it's more of a, um, um, a discretionary uh, suspension based on um, the way this is worded. And there, had, there wasn't a public notice about any kind of suspension under this order. Um, so I, I do still have questions about even using this i mean so does the law office have any kind of further information about this executive order i thought they were going to be here Lyles today was just here he just oh. stepped out moments ago maybe he's coming back all right well we'll have to see because we need um, him back i think it's clear with you know this language if you're asserting that the permits were never canceled even though in the record they were in every email they were and there's been no public notice that they were not. Um, I still think there are questions about the legality of that. You've got expert, that would apply for, uh, impact potential expiration, that would impact potential abandonment, which 
I've sent to all of you um, before because if the building permits were not um, issued, then there are ramifications to that as far as if their plan development is actually still valid. Um, when you're looking at um, expiration, it's talking about final development approval shall expire two years uh, if the building permit is not obtained prior to that date. So I guess that question is still up in the air. If you're asserting this executive, executive order kind of never canceled those permits. Is that right? Alderman, I don't think that's um, correct. Um, we have um, in track it uh, from the former um, Department of Neighborhoods and Environmental Programs that they met with planning and zoning and law on site in 2014 um, to determine that the project was vested um, and that vesting included infrastructure improvements were constructed on site. Well, the vesting question's separate. Uh, as far as expiration, it doesn't talk about vesting. It says a uh, final development shall expire two years after, from the date of final approval, which was 2006. If a building permit is not obtained prior to, in this case, 2008. And so my assertion is that if the permits were indeed canceled, they were, were they even ever obtained? Right. So are you referring all the way back to 2006 when the, before the project was told, correct, for six years, uh, which basically extended that planning and it did 2014, but then the building permits in 2014 right. were they, canceled, I thought. But now you're telling me they weren't canceled. Well, I th I'm not sure that's what Mr. Manasseh was saying. I think those permits were valid in 2014. They got a grading permit and they began right. con construction. Yes, They sir. were, but Thus the permits, vesting. building permit, let's see, I'll read them to you. Building permit. 14-0251 and building permit uh, building 17-0357 were both listed as canceled in 2020 so that's six years after 2014 so again if those permits were canceled they were no longer they weren't obtained so they would essentially have had no no obtained building permit 2014 on if they were canceled mm -hmm. I don't know. That's oh, and we, yeah, yeah. the 2014 building permits were reapplied for and uh, superseded by the 2017 permit. So the BLD 14-0252 was replaced by BLD 17-0357. I mean, that's why it's saying it was canceled, is because the a subsequent permit for the same structure was. A, applied okay. for and obtained okay well let's focus on the 17 then 17 0357 is listed as canceled in here correct and that's what i explained in that we inadvertently failed to uh notify the permit administrator that the permit was extended without her knowing that she canceled okay. the permit extended to when it was extended um let's see on um, December 4th, 2019, uh, the six month extension was approved. December 4th, 2019 approved. Where, so you're saying it was erroneously listed as canceled and that is instead extended. It should have been just an active building permit. But I mean, again, that's not what you told me in the email in 2020 that in, you, a letter was sent March 26, 2020. You sent a letter informing them all permits were void, and then you listed those four permits. Correct. And prior to that date, the emergency orders went into effect and extended all existing permits. So I, I believe that... Um, the extension was on March 12th. So um, would you say it was the 
What date? You said March 26th, you sent a letter. Right. So that's 13 days after the emergency order. I don't think I was quite aware of the significance of the COVID order extending all permits at that point. Um, okay. I'm just trying to understand. So, yeah, that, okay. That, so you're saying that permit 17 uh, was never canceled. Um, well, I mean, it was, it was clearly canceled. Even though you sent them a letter, it, it was, you're saying that was overruled by the executive order. So my question for Mr. Lyles is, have you seen this executive order? Sure. Is that a yes? Okay, so. Yes, I've seen the executive order. And so what's your reading of it? Does this, is this, because I'm, it also seems to say in here that suspension of legal time requirements, that it's um, a bit discretionary and that there's a public notice requirement. Um, I don't hear a question. Well, so do you concur with the analysis from Mr. Manasseh as far as the permit that they had sent a letter on March 26, 2020, saying the permits are void? That notice you're saying was made on, well, I just want to know. Um, Mr. Manasseh saying that notice of voiding the permits was um, overruled by this executive order from, which they didn't know about, from March 5th. Well, the executive order uses the word may, so I agree with you that it's discretionary on the department to belay any cancellations or terminations of permits. Okay, and so when did the department first know about this executive order? I'm not exactly sure when we became aware of the implications, but I do have uh, correspondence with Officer Law about the implications and what it means to all of our permits and licenses. Dated from when? Yeah, I don't have a date right in front of me. I'd have to research that. Well, what year generally did you win? Time oh, it was within you... probably a month or so of March. I would, I think it was probably sometime by April. So you're saying in 2020? Correct. Um, and so did you notify the applicant at that time? Because if it's a May, where's the decision document that was made that essentially said you're reversing the voiding letter that you sent on March 26, 2020? Where's that decision point where you, you're using the discretion of this executive order to cancel that? I mean, to uncancel the permit. We had a request on March 23rd, 2020, uh, from the attorney representing the owner uh, requesting the extension. Mr. Manasseh, can you tell us who that is? The owner? Yes, please. The owner is a group um, that go by the designation RLBB ACQ, the second MD RGD LLC, with the representative of the name Carl G. Becker. Carl Becker, okay. And the current owner uh, is Athens Property, or Athens Annapolis Property Owner LLC, under the name of. I'll um, try it. I know who it is. <laughs> okay. Um, so I know, and he just acquired the property within the last few months. Because prior to that, uh, Folger Pratt was the company that was uh, prepared to purchase the property. Well, if he didn't own it at the time, why is why did he send a letter in 2020? No, no, that's... I don't know. There, there's two different things. I'm answering the other question about okay. who the current owner is. That's the uh, Athens Annapolis okay. property owner. LLC mm -hmm. as referenced in the 2020, um, or I'm sorry, the 2022 issued grading permit. But the um, Carl Becker was the the point of contact for requesting the extension back in 2020. In 2020, it was Becker. But you said that letter was sent to you on March 23rd. Of 2020. 
but you s said in the email that on March 26th, a couple days later, you sent the letter informing that all the permits were canceled. Correct. And that was prior to consideration of the emergency order extending all permits. So when was the decision reversed to cancel? Um, let's see. I don't have an exact date for that. I, I know in discussions that it applied to all of our permits. So it, well, that's, all Mr. of our Lyles licenses. Is just saying it's discretionary and you have to actually. Okay. And it. our discretion was to apply it to all of our permits and licenses. That's, that was across the board. Where was that made? How, when was that made? How? Because you also says you have to provide a public notice. The unit shall provide reasonable public notice of any such suspension. You would have had to send a notice that, oh, city of Annapolis, all of your permits all over the place are suspended. Like, was that made? We, we, wait, I don't understand your question because you're asking if we notified the public that all of their permits were suspended. Is that what your question is? I'm saying, you, you're saying there's no decision point because you just decided that all the permits all over the city are, are suspended, right? No, that's incorrect. Okay, what are you saying then? That order authorizes and requires the extension of any existing permit which is due to expire or may expire. But that, that's, I mean, I'm confused. I mean, Mr. Lyles just said that that's a discretionary, not an automatic. What that order is telling us is that if there is an existing permit on file and it was subject to expiration, that it would be extended. And the same for any licenses or otherwise. That's not what it says. It says it's discretionary and that if you decide to suspend any permits, there has to be public notice. Okay, well, we didn't suspend any permits. That's that, what I'm that's, saying. That's what... But if you're saying permits don't expire, that's the suspension. Maybe I'm looking at it incorrectly, but if a permit doesn't expire, expire, I would think of that as an automatic extension, not a suspension. I mean, do you have any clarification, Mr. Lyles, on what's the suspension? The staff <clears throat> uh, are the experts in this particular field, and they have the authority and discretion to act in the best interest of the city. In this particular position, I'm not looking at the order, but just looking at listening to your words as you read the order, appears they applied discretion and they did it in a reasonable fashion. It's not on us. We don't do programs in the Office of Law. We can just advise about what the words may mean if they did provide the discretion to the, the department. Apparently, the department took the discretion and acted upon that in a way that I think is consistent with every state and local government across the state of Maryland. Because if you had a license that was going to expire, or if you had any kind of business license that was going to expire, you had a permit for anything that was going to expire. I don't know of any state function or local government in the entire state that did not extend uh, those expiring permits of all kinds across the state. So I think staff may have been acting consistently with everybody in the state at the time because it was a, um, a an emergency of um, kind of untold proportions and a case really a first impression on the state. But that's not to say that your thoughts about it aren't incorrect. I'm just saying that the, the department interprets language that it uses to authorize its activities as it can and will. Um, and it is the first uh, line of thinking about how words are interpreted it's with the staff that does it every day. And we can only uh, advise if there's a point of clarification uh, or a point of contention. And that hasn't surfaced until now. Are there any other questions about this from the um, committee? I do. Um... I guess the ultimate question for me is how we move forward. I'll be honest, I'd like to see a stop work order on the project for a number of reasons. We have known that this property has been controversial for many, many, many years. And for 
the permitting to be approved and the project to be allowed, a project to be allowed to move forward without adequate notice to anyone in the community, including the alderwoman who sits, or that property sits in her ward, me, uh, I think that's inappropriate. I think action needs to be taken to make sure that one, we don't treat our residents in such a fashion that they're not important. And secondly, it feels very much like we are manipulating what projects come into the city and which ones don't. And so how do we address that? I think from the mayor on down, we have said that workforce housing is a priority. It is a need, and not minimally. But from what I can understand, and I could be wrong because I haven't seen the plans, that this is not workforce housing. This is high-end housing just like we're familiar with all over the city. Not appropriate. So where do we go from here? Mr. LaPlace, I asked for a meeting with the developer because I think he should know and should hear from me and other aldermen how we feel and we want to hear what the plans are. There has been no discussion with Oxford Landing about how we're going to deal with traffic on Yall Road. And over 10 years, the community has changed drastically. You know, the concern 10 years ago was the children and the road being narrow, and the fact that it would be unsafe. And now 10 years later, we're going to put the same project into place without any consideration for adapting to the existing community. State Highway has been here any number of times to work with us to figure out how we could ad adapt to, or how Aris Allen could be adapted to serve the community. So, you know, we've been talking about this, but to allow this project to move forward without any questions answered, without any notification, without any community input, I think is highly inappropriate. Alderwoman, in the short time I've been in Annapolis, I've been very impressed with the dedication of the staff at Planning and Zoning to want what's best for this community. And I know that they're very concerned about affordable housing and workforce housing. Having said that, my understanding that this project still has a valid approval, so I don't understand unless someone can educate me because I am new to Maryland. Does everyone get a second shot at reviewing an approved application? I mean, I, I guess it goes to the question of whether licenses and permits lapsed or not, but you, you, I think you said something along the lines that people weren't informed or the community didn't know, and I'm not sure if there was a legal trigger where we would have opened up an approved site plan for re-examination by the community. Um, maybe that's just on me and I have a learning curve here, but I, I, I don't know if there was a requirement to, I, I agree with you, this is a very old project. I can't believe that it's been going on this long, but if it's still a valid project that was approved by the, by, by the city, I don't understand how we could stop it necessarily. Uh, I, I well, think maybe at the very least, the community could have been notified. They're, Notified they're, that it was starting up again, do you mean? Th that these folks have done? bulldozers in their backyard today. Correct. Without any notification. They woke up one morning three weeks ago, and there are bulldozers and heavy equipment there. I mean, how would you feel if that No, I would be very concerned. I would call City <laughs> Hall and speak to staff. And, and my staff speaks to members of the community every day answering these kind of questions. You know that because you're very helpful in giving us some of those questions and we try to get right back to the community. I know in the states like New Jersey where I've worked longer than Maryland, um, you know, there isn't a, a trigger to alert the entire community once work actually gets started on a site. So I don't know if someone can tell me if there's a requirement in Maryland, I, I, it'd be important for me to understand that. Well, I don't know whether there's a trigger or not, but there should be. Well, you no, know, we Mr. represent the community. Chair, it certainly would be a courtesy. Um, Alderman sorry. Arnett. <laughs> Alderman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I try not to punish you too much with this time lapse. This has long been known to be a controversial project. We were getting steady updates from planning staff saying this project was dormant. It was not going forward. <coughs> now all of a sudden, it has gone forward with no notice. Forget the community to us. And 
I think we would have wanted to have had some input about why this is restarting, why it's restarting without any input from us. And I think that there's really something that is fundamental in effect with the way this is going. And I agree with you all in Ward 5. We need to stop until we can find out what's going on. There's all kinds of ambiguity. There's all kinds of inconsistencies. There's interpretations being made that I think are not clear, but have a big impact on how this is this work is going forward. I know you're going to hear from Oxford Landing and other community about this surprise, and that's what it is, and that's not the right way to do business. Yeah, and and on that note, and and I do see what, um, Mr. Director, what you're saying as far as the the original trigger point for public comment was the plan development process, which went to the at that time Board of Appeals, and then went back to the Planning Commission a number of years later. I forget when exactly, which also had public comment. Uh, there's a trigger for public comment with forest conservation, but the problem is they're operating off of, and I'll get to forest conservation in a few minutes. But um, as far as triggering that process again, but is, when you mentioned the, the um, validity of the plan and, and the urgency of the stop work order, besides the obvious as far as, um, you know, they're already clearing in more trees under approval, which I'll make the case needs to be revoked. And um, that alone, I think, environmentally needs to be stopped. But also as far as um, determining status. And so... The other part of the expiration clause in our code, and, and I've got it, I'm sorry you don't have a screen facing you because of um, the virtual, but it says if substantial site development has not commenced within a period of three years from the date of final approval, um, and it's so for in the case of larger developments, if it hasn't started on each phase of the project indicated on the plan development plan, then the plan development approval shall expire. And so it's talking about if sub substantial site development has not commenced. And so that's the one question I have now, because I think that's going to be one of the key questions, is what, what work has been done out there currently on the site? I'm not sure, Alder, when I'm following your, your question. What, what work has been done on the project site? I mean, the, as I mentioned as earlier, as or the, the project received that, that substantial work under its vesting. Sorry. I mentioned earlier um, that the project received its vesting, which is another word that we use for substantial work begun. What, when? Uh, in 2014, they, they installed infrastructure. And what was the infrastructure? Installed? Storm drain system. The storm drain system? Right. Or was it just a silt fence? No, sir. There's actually documentation from the Department of Neighborhoods and Environmental Programs that they met on site with planning and zoning and the office of law, they took photographs of the storm drain system, the infrastructure that was installed. Is that the temporary storm drain system associated with sediment control or is it the permanent? No, it's permanent. It's concrete piping and manholes and- now How much of it was in- That I don't honestly know, sir. Um, cause I think that's, that's another key question cause you know, I've done a lot of research on vesting laws in Maryland and we are a late vesting state. And I know there's very, the various cases where um, you know, they've, they've had footers installed and that's been determined not to be enough to get vested. And there was a situation in Rockville, I think, that had um, some, a similar situation. They said there actually needed to be a permanent structure. Storm drain system, I would argue, is certainly not permanent structure. If that's the decision that the department's making, then um, I don't know if there's much we could do about that. But I, I'm under the impression that storm drain system is a permanent structure. Well, it's still it's it's still covered with dirt and able to be removed and adjusted right. um, at this and, stage in the project. It's not. We have utilized that and footings in the past to determine vesting, um, and that comes out of case law, which we get our direction from the Office of Law on that. Um, so we are certainly being fair and consistent with any other project where it's been utilized. It doesn't get utilized very often. I have, must admit. Well, may I ask, because yes. I'm, I'm confused. 
2014, I believe it was, when they cleared the property, let's put it in normal terms, they cleared the property because they had to. And they did it in the spring, if I remember correctly. There was a date certain when it had to be done. And so what I'm hearing is that then they laid um, the pipes for that project that was approved in 2006. But since then, we've entertained at least two other developers, maybe three, with different plans for that same property. And some of the plans even expanded beyond the footprint of the original. Absolutely. So how can, why were we entertaining other developers' proposals? I mean, are, were they expected to then come in and redo what had been done in 2014? I don't understand how that works. Help me. Well, it's, it's not common, but it's also not uncommon for a developer to change a project. Uh, one developer wants to build X, a second developer purchases and wants to make modifications to it. Um, we've modified projects of this nature often, just as we recently modified Park Place for a new hotel. Um, so we, we did entertain those, those development applications. One actually went all the way to the Special Court of Appeals. Well, and, and I understand changes, but I recall very clearly uh, when the office, your office, wanted to turn the whole project around, move it back from Forest Drive. There was a proposal to make the access road run parallel to Forest Drive. Significant, not minor changes, but significant changes to the proposal. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. So I'm, I'm just not clear. We, we allowed and, these companies to come in and propose their projects to us. And we, you know, told them what was wrong with it. They came in with other proposals. Uh, end of the day, all rejected for whatever reason. And some of them, it was personal. They just backed out because they didn't want to deal with the city. Um, but now we have a proposal that's jumping back to the very original plan. And I'm, I'm just bewildered. I'm sorry. So with all of those proposals, the original plan was still an approved plan. Um, and we did have a number of developers while the project was for sale looking at that original plan and options to that original plan. I believe we also, the plan you mentioned that expanded it, we had a work session with the Planning Commission. Um, and, and they, that project actually had to cross the headwaters of the creek that would have inquired substantial environmental impacts. Um, and that developer elected not to go forward. It was actually a great idea, right? Well, it was in, until they got the response. But yeah. they weren't even presenting a plan. They were giving us a concept proposal. Yeah, yes, ma'am. That's and, what it was. And, and, and they didn't even get to uh, reevaluate what they had done to bring something more substantial to us before they kind of threw up their hands and said, forget yeah. it. And that's unfortunate. But we, we did it entertain is. them with, with a work session at the Planning Commission. And because and that was, uh, that was right. a workforce housing project. Yes, ma'am. Something that we needed. A absolutely. Well, so what, as far as what's been, uh, what has been approved now, as far as the, the grading permit for the plan from 2020, uh, in terms of what they're installing right now, is that, how does that differ from what was approved in the plan development in 2006? The design. The design is, has not changed, Alderman. It, it is, the, is the exact same design layout. Okay. It's the same layout's being installed now. 48 units, the same number of townhomes, the same number of MPDUs, single families, open space, forest conservation, all recorded on a record plat in the land records. Ban uh, and how many phases are, is a part of that? No phases. One no phase. Phases the plan development was approved all as one. I'm trying to think of a project maybe going back to Kingsport, perhaps phasing. But ordinarily, our projects in the city are so small, they are not phased, oh. mm -hmm. at least not from a plan development perspective. Most applicants do not want to go back to the Planning Commission and ask for approval of a second phase. They want it all in one. So the storm drain system is going to be the same 
with this design as was originally proposed as far as the pipe location? I would, I honestly want to defer to public works who reviews the storm drain, but generally speaking, I would say yes. Okay. Do we have an answer from public works? Ms. Ms. Patrick and Mr. Bryce. Just a question for you, you two, uh, the, the proposed stormwater, the proposed storm drain orientation that is being installed for the project. So this is for Rocky Gorge. Um, does the storm drain system being in, in the approved plans, the approved grading plans from 2020, well, they approved 2022, does that storm drain system differ at all than what was approved in the 2006 um, plan development approval? I can't answer that because I don't know. I can. Mr. Price, do you happen to know? And I, and I concur with Marsha because neither one of us have looked at the plans and and. When I reviewed the plans, I reviewed them back in like 2006. Okay. Um, maybe even earlier than that. That's how long this project has been around. However, we, we spoke with Matt this morning about the, uh, about the project. And what Matt told us was that much of the, and of the stormwater management on that site being the, uh, control of stormwater for quality and quantity um, had been modified to come more in line with our current regulations. So the, uh, the, the, the percentage of treatment that is provided while it does not meet the standard that we are attempting to meet which was which was 125 percent of well, of the pre-development it let me, does let me stop you saying that because i'm not we're not on that topic yet i just want to know it sounds like you may not know the answer but i, I just want to I'm, I'm asking this question because i want to know this project was vested based on the storm drain infrastructure is what i'm being told and i would like to see that could someone please send me that document from dnep that specifies why it was vested and what the rationale was that was adopted from the law office because I remember Mr. Elson was involved in that. We can forward that okay. uh, line. Thank you. We can forward that item from track it along with the photographs to you. Okay, Alderman. thank you. Uh, is I just want to make sure that's that's what the project's being vested based on the storm drain system. I want to make sure that that vested infrastructure is the same infrastructure that's going to be installed with the new project based on their 2022 grading permit approval and stormwater management plan. If you don't have that answer today, that's fine. I just I want to know that answer at some point. Because if, if we're, I want to make sure we're not vesting based on infrastructure that's going to be different or removed anyway as part of the, part of the final design, because that wouldn't make no sense to me. I understand but, what I'm I, I, I I understand okay. your your question. I again, I have not looked at the plans for any number of years. I would suspect if you ask me to render an opinion, I would suspect because I believe they're running off the same plat plat configuration as they had previously, which means the roads are would still be in the same place and and I'll ask Tom, is that true? It's same plat configuration, isn't it? Yes, it's okay. the same layout. Same layout. Since that's the case, I would not see them changing that backbone drainage system because you're going to still put the drains in the roads. You're going to still have your outfalls in generally the same location. Mm -hmm. So I would expect that that to have followed the same pattern from the, the from the original design. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. If you can confirm that when you have an opportunity. Um, any other questions on that substantive, the vesting? So if that's what's being asserted by staff, that would not kick in this clause for expiration. Abandonment is not gonna be valid because um, they're saying the permits were never canceled. 
But I think this slide still would make the point that I can't help but to feel that we're trying to find ways to let this project keep living on and on. And I'm calling it a zombie permit because it's just, you can't get rid of it. It's just, it's, it's essentially can't, wasn't going away. And I think it's pretty clear when you look at the laws on our books, it's pretty clear that we, it, they're designed to kind of prevent these kind of project permits from lasting years and years. I mean, we spend so much effort and time trying to get these new laws passed, but now they're operating off 2006, sometimes a little newer, but 2014 approvals, it's, I hope you can understand how frustrating that is um, from our standpoint when, again, there is, to a certain degree, some amount of discretion, right? I mean, I feel like uh, staff could, because there's case law on both sides, staff could have went out there and said this project's no longer vested. We can get to that case law to support it, let them try to sue, but it's gone both ways in Maryland. Um, but instead, the decision's being made to kind of side for the developer instead of the council, instead of the public interest. Because let's face it, if this would follow the most current code, we would have more affordable housing, better environmental protection, better stormwater management. And that's the frustrating part here. Mr. Chairman, I understand and share your frustration, but I don't think it's really fair to say that the department had an agenda or was trying to help one side versus the other. The department works for the entire community, the property owners, community members, neighbors, and developers have rights too. And I'm guessing eight years ago when, when the project was vested, that seemed like the right decision at the time. Um, these are honorable, good people making the best decision they can. So I don't think it's fair to imply that there was an agenda or a bias. And I haven't seen any evidence of that in the short time I've worked with these people here in Annapolis. Okay, well, I mean, I, I, with all due respect, I've been here for 22 years now, involved in a lot of development issues for that time. And, um, you know, we've seen it come up now and then. Um, I, I certainly, overall, staff does a really excellent job. Um, you know, Mr. Smith's been a uh, great champion in applying some of the new law, forest conservation laws that we've, we've gotten passed on the books. Um, you know, but I've also seen situations with, with all of the project we'll talk about next if we have time, um, where um, there were questions about permit, um, whether or not they were valid, and there, were, uh, there was, the law wasn't super clear to be, to be uh, honest, but instead of using that lack of clarity to benefit the taxpayer, it went towards um, the developer. And I get that they have rights, but um, uh, you know, I think that's been a, certainly a long-standing issue in this town as far as um, all these development pressures uh, having impacts. You know, that's, that's frankly what got me elected, uh, our county executive elected, were the development pressures. Um, and over the time, we've worked really hard to bring those in line, be it school impacts, um, forest conservation, traffic impacts. Um, but, you know, I think this one especially is frustrating because of how old it is. Just gonna, I was just going to say the same thing. I think the most frustrating aspect of this is that you're looking at a fossil, basically, a project that would probably be so much different if it came before the commission or the Board of Appeals now. But it's just this weird situation that there's been such a time lag. So I understand your frustration because the people of this community want something different now and the priorities have changed. So we get yeah. that. Well, I mean, if, if you get it, I mean, would, would you be... There is an opportunity, again, if, if, if you can contest the vested rights to say, well, look, we've reviewed this and we've determined they don't have vested interest. We don't believe they do and we want them to start over and apply our most current law. I mean, that's, we could at least get an opinion from the law office to see if that'd be a, a reasonable track to go down. But I'm not hearing any kind of consideration of taking that approach. Well, I, I think that's because there's, the project is online right now and, and construction's underway. So I don't think unilaterally our department decided to, to question a decision that you know, goes back eight or 10 years. And I think we would need le legal guidance. I feel that quite frankly, this department deserves some legal guidance in, in making such a you know, sure. significant change in direction. Sure, yeah, but you know, and also I th think it's a factor to also consider uh, the public's perspective as far as construction is not that old. It's only a little over a month. I should probably not even 
I guess it is, 40 days or so. Um, but as far as the, the local older women and the residents not even being notified of this. Um, but may may I ask yes. a question? Um, first of all, it should be clear, Mr. LaPlace, you're new, and we welcome you here. But you should know that I am the greatest employee advocate in this city. And I don't speak disparagingly of people. At the same time, I hold everybody to a high standard. I expect the best because we represent the residents of Annapolis and they deserve the best. So please don't take my remarks as personal attacks on your staff. I've worked with them extensively and I appreciate greatly all that they do. But when something's wrong, it needs to be corrected. My residents are not happy. The residents of Oxford Landing are not happy. And if you take a ride out there, you'll very quickly see what the problem is. So the question is, how do we address that? You know, I've asked for a meeting with the developer. I've not gotten a response. So I can take it upon myself to do it, and I will. But the three of us, I think, have agreed we'd like to see a stop work order until it's all resolved. I think that we can make a motion to do just that because there are just too many questions unanswered. And since we can't even get the straight of who's the property owner, we just got it, but I had already done my research uh, and found out who they are. But, you know, we ask questions and we need answers because we need solutions. So we're going to look to you to help us figure out what our next step is. And it's not status quo, because that's not gonna satisfy the problems that this project will create in the community, in my community. So we need your help and guidance. All right, so for, um so is there going to be any kind of consideration given to putting a stop work order on this project to work out? I, mean, I haven't even gotten to some of the issues. Yeah, I think we would need some legal direction on whether we have the ability to do that at this point. Yeah. I certainly would want my department to have that guidance. John, I don't know if you want to add anything. So now, Mr. Bryce, uh, if, if you'd be willing to join us again for this. Now I do have the question about the stormwater management. I think you were starting to get into it. Uh, I, and just for the record on, uh, and I think I do have copies of it if people need to see it, but on January 25th, 2021, the applicant did submit a stormwater variance request relative to the city's 125% ESD volume rule, which we passed in uh, 2018. So my, First question would be, was that variance granted? Did you want to see a copy of it? No, I just, okay. you know, one of the, I'm being very cautious because one of the problems with, with wearing a mask is if your glasses keep going. Oh, turn your mic on. One of, as, as I was saying, one of the problems with, with COVID is you wear a mask and your glasses keep fogging up, so I have to kind of switch back and forth. Um, my understanding is that a... Just hold on for one second, please. Sure, no problem. Okay. Um, well... Sam, we'll give you some time, Mr. Bryce, like, and, um, if you'd like. How much time do you? All right.
do you want five minutes? No, I, I think I think I'm good. Um, my my concern is I'm not really sure exactly what the stormwater waiver of that date was. However, I do know that a uh, a, a stormwater um, waiver was granted. Uh, they they and part of that granting was they changed the. Uh, the many of the structural practices or some of the structural practices that they had on site to uh, more of the environmental site design practices they were able to th through those changes to get uh, to 122% um, of the um, required storm stormwater of the um, pre-development stormwater management requirements. Um, they could not get to the 120 or the 125 percent, but they were at 122 percent, um, and that that was reflected on their construction drawings. And that is what is scheduled to be built um, under this under the grading permit. Okay. So the 122 percent is the final. Yes. For on-site yes. treatment. Um, okay. Well, that's not too bad, um, but kind of interesting. They they couldn't get that extra three percent. What they they did some. What they they did was they did over some over management on the site so they could get that additional additional. Um, that additional treatment. Okay. Um, well, it's good to hear that it wasn't uh, at least. Uh, it's good to hear they're at least still treating 122 percent. Um, I think, and this maybe is a process question for my colleagues, but I, I think it'd be good if if the council would be notified of some of these larger variance requests um, to. Some of these projects mm -hmm. in the future, but we may need to work that into code. Um, any other comments on this particular stormwater? I'm not. I mean, I feel better about it if it's 122 percent than I did prior. But um, so I'll leave it there. Any other comments from the committee on this stormwater part? 122 is as good as it gets. <laughs> okay. The next is, thank you, Mr. Bryce. Uh, the next is forest conservation standards. Um, so they're operating off of their 2014 approvals. The, the grading permit, from the, which was just approved 2022, last month, includes the 2014 forest conservation approvals. And you know, I don't think it's... I think it's I think it's intuitive that when the grading perm well I guess this question goes to Mr. Manasseh as far as the grading permits there were two grading permits the one both of them were canceled at the same time are you saying those permits also essentially have were not canceled because of the executive order from the governor Correct they were not canceled if they were canceled, they were canceled incorrectly, is my view of it. Um, now that they've been superseded by the current grading permit, yes, they are canceled now. Okay, and so the new grading permits using this 2014 approval, um, I think, and that 2014 approval predates, and this is for Mr. Place's, I think, sake, uh, the council has overhauled the forest conservation law on a couple of occasions. They did it in was it 2016 or 17 under the Somewhere two councils here. ago. And then um, we did it last term where we made it, uh, improved it even further, just making it known at loss as we call it. So there's, because previously the Forest Conservation Act, which is a Maryland law, you know, it um, had a built in deficiency where it kind of, you would end up losing more forest over, over um, than you'd actually gain. So we've changed that last term by 
capacity known at loss, as we called it, uh, that did grandfather forest conservation plans that had approval prior to the effective date, passage date of that um, legislation. And um, so this would fall under that. I fully admit that. However, uh, with a new grading permit, I think that would make sense because grading, you know, you're talking about moving land around and that's really when you start to clear the trees. It would really make sense to have that be a trigger point for requiring new forest conservation approval. I know that's not how the code, it's not specified in the code and that's something I'll have to make a note to, to change. But the one provision that I think I do want to bring to the department's attention is the revocation clause. And this is in our own forest conservation code. I've got it up on the screen. It says, department may revoke an approved forest conservation plan if it finds that, and it lists a number of things, but in particular, if it finds that changes in the development or in the condition of the site necessitate pre preparation of a new or amended plan. And, and my assertion would be that a, a tornado coming through the prop project um, and the clearing by the previous developer uh, could certainly be considered a change in the condition of the site. And so that would be my one request would be that um, the department look at revoking the, the current 2014 approval to get them to comply with the known at loss and to assess the entire forest to see what may have changed and if, if anything needs to be done differently. Uh, the new law has built in a five-year expiration for forest conservation plans and forest end delineations for these reasons. The forest changes and trees get larger. Sometimes they'll be, you know, especially in this case, uh, eight years ago, over a period of eight years, there may have been a number of trees that are all now considered uh, specimen trees, which would have a diameter breast height of 30 inches or greater. Actually, I think we may have lowered that to 24. I can't remember. In the, in the new law, but um, in any case, those kind of things need to be caught with the new forest conservation plans. And so I think that would be a, one reason um, to look at this clause. So that, that's the one request. I know my colleagues share the sentiment, but that's certainly one request I would like to make is that the department looks at that. Uh, Alderman, I'd be happy to look at that if that's the direction given us from the Office of Law that we are allowed to then go back and revoke this um, and relook at it and apply new laws to a permit that was already active, uh, which is why we didn't apply it because we had an active grading permit. The new permit didn't change from the old permit from a disturbance standpoint. Um, I understand well, the revocation cause, but you're talking about a natural disaster. Uh, which we're all very sympathetic to, right? Um, I'm not sure how that in and of itself changes what we would or would have done differently now or then. Well, I think it's something that needs to be considered, I would think, in the forest and delineation to determine the overall stand, changes in stand health. It might change what is determined for mitigation. Um, you know, but I know I know you've been one of the people who've brought this up to me before. As far as I know, you've required new forest delineations on properties because you know the trees grow over eight years. Yes, and they, sir. Indeed. So I think that's one thing we're missing with this is that there could be the specimen trees that are weren't there eight years ago, frankly, um, and need to be considered for protection. And I don't recall exactly how much the site was cleared originally versus what was proposed to be cleared. And while I did not walk the area where the tornado came through, but just in going down Aris Allen, it seems to be over the area that was in conservation already. Um, and how that would be handled, um, likely through natural regeneration. Um, could it get some assistance with some reforestation? Don't disagree with you, right? That we could probably help that environment by giving it some assistance through more than just natural regeneration. Um, but I don't think that impacts the development portion of the project in any way. Well, we don't know that, right? Um, I think that needs to be looked at as far as putting together. I think it's just another reason to put a stop work order on the site um, is to 
get this sorted out. Uh, you, you said you want clarification from the law office, uh, and, and I respect that and understand that, um, but in the meantime, we could be losing trees, theoretically, that may otherwise need to get protected. Uh, and so it seems to me to really warrant, I mean, that, that clause is in there for a reason. You can revoke permits also for violations of the permit condition. So that would, in my mind, mean that you can revoke even after projects is active and underway, right? Um, and so, but if you want to clarify the law, if I say, please understand, um, but, you know, what's going to happen in the meantime? While we look at that, while we look at these other issues we brought up. I mean, stop work order, it's, it's, it's you need to get clarification on that too, but that, that's why it's there, right? is to stop it for reasons like this when we need to um, get a better understanding of uh, permit conditions and if they've changed and so on and so forth. Any other comments on this from the committee? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Yes, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I'll be direct. I'll be I am very angry very about angry this turn of events and to be direct, and to be direct again, again I feel that we have been abused by the abused staff, by the staff. For, months, for months we received we receive updates from updates director from Nash about the status, about the status of this status project. Of this project. We, also we also attended hearings before, before the planning commission, planning commission discussing, discussing new proposals. New proposals. And now all of a sudden this zombie permit is back and work is being done. This is not an acceptable treatment of the council or this committee. We just cannot have these surprises. I know that the staff get it in the neck from the community, but we do too, and these are people that we represent. And I know that there's a great deal of anger in the community, and I share their anger, and I find this unacceptable and to be immovable about taking any, let's stop and take a look at this, is not acceptable to me. And I am not happy. So, these, Alderman, I yes. suspect we are going to need a resolution from the council yeah. um, with our reasoning. And I guess we should just move forward with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, these, these provisions are in there for a reason. Um, and I think you're hearing from us that we think there is justification to um, utilize them from the stop work order, but also the revocation clause. Um, it's in there. We're asking you to do it for the public good, and I guess we'll have to turn it into a resolution. But I, I would like to ask that, again, that, that the departments consider putting a stop work order until we can get these issues sorted out. So is that something that you consider? I should let John talk about it since he's the code official, but we've been considering since it was first brought up. It's just we're not sure we have the justification and we need legal guidance on this. Well, when was it first brought up? I don't know, several days ago. And you still haven't gotten legal justification or a confirmation from the law office? I mean, you can sit down. I'm sorry, but... You could sit. Somebody could set an appointment with the law office, sit down with them, and figure out: Can we do this? The older persons are blowing up about this. The public's blowing up about this. Let's see: Can we do this? If so, let's do it. To the chair, it wasn't put to us to do a stop work order. It was brought up as a possibility, and we've been trying to. You know, we've been doing background information. I'm certainly. I need to get educated on this because I wasn't even here. But um, if you want us to consider actually doing a stop work order. I think we need some legal counsel on whether we have the jurisdiction to do that, whether it's appropriate. And John, I don't know if you need any more than that, but you know. Well, do you, I mean. We don't I, just, I mean, there's lots of projects in the city that people criticize and get upset about and call us. We don't do stop worker orders every time somebody's upset about a project. You have to, you know, that's a pretty serious. Well, I mean, I've, I've, we've just walked through a, a large number of 
issues. I mean, stop work orders are issued all the time. I agree with you, but I'm not a land use attorney, and I and I don't feel qualified to make this okay, determination, but, particularly because I'm not that knowledgeable of Maryland law. I understand, but I think, I think you're is, asking the wrong people. I understand, but I feel like if there's amb if there's concern about it, we're asking you to take an action to benefit again benefit the public. And yes, there may be some amount of risk to it. And worst case scenario, the developers are going to sue the city to say you put the stop work order in appropriately but in the meantime we'll we've got probably get things figured out before it even gets to the court right because all we need is probably a week or so to figure this out um because I, I i don't hear this level of 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 i guess hesitancy to issue stop work orders um uh when it comes time to you know when we put when we put them on building permits that have violations or things like that and we're giving you an instance here where uh, there are sections of the law which i think were overlooked um by staff as far as uh, forest conservation and then there are the questions about approval and again the, the risk of not the danger of not putting a stop work order down is that we lose resources and impact that property that we can't recover if we lose a champion, a specimen tree, we can't recover that tree. It's gone. But I, I think we're not right. talking about the same thing. I have, I am, I am passionate about saving trees and the environment. I've, I've been my entire life. I'm over 30 years as a professional planner. Having said that, my concern as a director of planning and zoning is to make sure we have a justification to stop work order. It's not about whether it's a valid request. It sounds like a very valid concern, and of course it is. And if the community is concerned about it, we're concerned about it. And I just need, I mean, I need to know, is do we? Is this an appropriate stop work order to do? If only we had someone from the law office to speak to it now, but. Um, okay. Did he respond to her? Mm -hmm. Do I have the response? Oh. The response. Oh, I thought you were asking about no, responses no. from the um, city attorney. Okay, well, I guess... May, may I um, yes. add something? Yes. Um, Ms. Philippe, I called your office in maybe the second week of June inquiring about this project. Uh, so it's been a month. And Mr. Smith did call me a week or so later, um, but didn't have the information. I needed the name of the company, et cetera. He did provide information but told me to go to the law department so i think that's the mantra that that we're using um people complain you're right all the time we're talking a whole community um i had requested that a meeting be set up and i'm going to request that again because i think it's appropriate that you would do that for for me a meeting set i'm up very with, comfortable setting i'll reach out to the uh, we have never said we wouldn't do that i asked you the last time we spoke it was a couple could, days ago correct we, in the meantime, you asked for other information that we provided to Ms. you. Mr. LaPlace, I don't want to debate with you. I'm just asking you to set up a meeting for me. I'd be happy to do that. And the legal department has told us that we need a resolution if we would like to stop work. Oh, okay. I wasn't aware of that. that I, that's because I know. just got it. Okay. <laughs> so that's why that's I'm speaking news. now. Thank you. So, that's um, good to know. And I think maybe we need a motion to do a resolution. Um, and I will make that motion that we uh, write a resolution uh, requesting a stop work order with appropriate justification. Is there a... Okay. And it's been second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, I think that's a good idea. I, I, I don't... That's going to take time to get passed and drafted, and I don't think that's necessary to actually put a stop work order in place. Um, so, if it could, could you have a conversation with the law office tomorrow to determine, in their advice, if it's legally allowed for you to put to, or address your concerns about putting a software order in place? Yeah, we'll reach out to the law department, certainly. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I think you likewise should send your list of okay. um, justifications for it, for the stop work do, order. Do what? I said, likewise, I think you should send your list oh, okay. of um, concerns uh, for the stop work order. Okay, and, and, and Ms. Green told me I did not do a vote. So all those in favor um, of the aye. motion, we say aye. Aye. He said aye. I saw his lips moving. Aye. Aye. <laughs> aye. 
with with any luck, we'll be able to speak with the the developer and have some of our questions and concerns laid before the meeting even. Um, oh, yeah, and I forgot this whole other issue of monitor the price dwelling unit. Uh, which standard are the following, 2006 or current? The, the original, uh, which actually requires the developer to provide the units. How many? The, um, off the top of my head, I can't remember if it's five or six, but there is one MPDU in every stick of townhomes. And that's recorded on a record plat in the land records. And they've met with uh, Teresa Wellman, who administers that program. Glad that they'll have some. Um, but yeah, my concern is we, looking at the history, there have been a lot of revisions to the MPD law, um, probably about half a dozen over the past decade. Uh, my colleagues on the, on the committee have, have uh, sponsored and voted for many of them. In my Five years on the council, we've passed uh, like three. Uh, we've increased the standards, the eligibility of who can go uh, live in an MPDU. We, we've updated uh, the density, the percentage, I think to 15% uh, is the current percentage of MPDUs that are required. And so I think there's no question that under the current new law, there would be more MPDUs under what was as compared to the 2006. And this is contingent on, I think, the original plan development. But again, that's just to express, I think, the frustration. I think you know uh, very well how much we've talked about affordable housing and needing it in the city. And, and um, that's just another frustration that, well, they're getting away with 2006 approvals. We are sympathetic with that and that frustration, trust me. Any other comments on MPDUs? Okay. All right, we've talked about how to proceed. Uh, I think that's a bit, that's all. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Thank you. All right, um, I would like to invite uh, Public Works talk about and miss god are you joining us for this one we'll leave a mic over there if you want to chime in um oh and i i do want to do what i did last time i'm going to hold you to two minutes if there's anybody from the public who would like to talk prior to the staff testimony and i know we have um so this is the Parkside Preserve project we're talking about now. And I know, I see we have the park superintendent for Quiet Waters, uh, and I do want to invite you to come speak. Um, so you're welcome to come up now or wait till we get to the particular issue in question. It's already getting late, so. <laughs> Hello. And just state your name and address for the record, please. Uh, my name is Allison Woodfield. I'm the park superintendent at Quiet Waters Park. Do you want the address? 600 Quiet Waters Park Road in Annapolis. So I'm your neighbor. Um, so I came today uh, because I daily deal with the park and my job there is to manage that resource, that valuable resource we have. And, Anne Arundel County that folks in the county and the city can use. And just to preface, I am not a subject matter expert on sediment control and runoff, but I do know my job as a land manager is to be the best steward of the land I manage. I came to the county about three years ago and immediately my staff and I began to remedy some of the things that we saw in the park um, that needed some help. For example, we partnered with the Rundle Rivers on a stream restoration project recently in Caffrey Run, um, where there was considerable runoff. Um, the county has invested this fiscal year over a million dollars in a second stream restoration project that will happen in Quiet Waters Park. So, um, you know, we're the largest landowner on Harness Creek, 
um, about a mile and a half of waterfront. And so we try, we're trying to be the best stewards of the land we manage in the creek. So, um, so I've been copied on many emails from citizens and folks from the city and folks from the county, our friends group, our volunteers. So I've kind of just compiled some and I brought pictures. Is it okay if I bring them up? Okay. Um, so I, two of the pictures, do you want me to stop talking until I get back? Okay. I'll explain them when I get back. So the pictures that I have presented are of the stream that comes behind our maintenance shop um, under our pavilion trail, which is near the Parkside Preserve um, development. And that continues under our maintenance road through a gully and eventually into Harness Creek. So these two pictures were taken almost exactly a year apart to the day. So the first one was taken early July of 2021. And if you want to hold that one up. Okay, so that was after rainfall. So that's inside Quiet Waters Park, um, just beyond our maintenance shop. The second picture was taken in the exact same spot um, July 11th of this year. So in that time, um, the city has facilitated the contractor place some um, uh, I think they were coil logs and mulch logs in the area to help prevent some of the runoff. Unfortunately, with our recent rainfall, I don't think they really uh, made much of a difference. So, and I do have other pictures. I don't have to bore you with all of them, but similar places in the park where we've just recorded um, the brown, my staff calls it chocolate milk, um, the brown water that's in the park. So we're continuing to see it. Um, it's not lessening, it's not clear. Um, I have a picture of my hand um, in the water on the 11th. Um, this is right at the gully, um, as right before you go into the maintenance shop area. So, so that's all I have. Again, do, if you have any questions for me. Uh, yeah, I mean, have you noticed a change in the stream or have any concerns about that stream that leaves the, the project site and enters into the park? Yeah, there we've seen a lot of changes in that area of the forest overall. I mean, um, the amount of water that's sitting, um, a lot of the leaves are kind of leaving that area. So that's just the whole stream bed is different now. Um, it's not really able to filter any of the water at this point, and it's just kind of gushing through. Um, it's pooling in a lot of areas. We didn't see water before in the last three years. We've seen that change. Okay. Any question? Any other questions from the committee? Okay. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you. Uh, anybody else like to provide public testimony? Come on up, Pam. I'm Carol Sayer. I'm with the Friends of Quiet Waters Park. You state your address. Two eight zero eight Broadview Terrace, Indianapolis. And um, the Friends is a nonprofit organization. We were founded when the park was uh, first founded, and our purpose is to provide the citizens the opportunity to raise and invest funds for the operation, preservation, development, and enrichment of the Quiet Waters Park. I'm currently the chairman of the Environmental Committee for that Friends. Um, in November 2021, we issued a position paper on the Parkside development and the effect it was having on the park itself. Well, just on the part on the development, the effect it was having. And in this statement, uh, the friends explained that our responsibility is to help protect both the land occupied by the park and Harness Creek, which is part of the adjacent watershed. And we also expressed our concerns that the Parkside Preserve construction was currently changing the stream flow from the land into the parkland and cause running off, causing a lot of um, polluted runoff into Harness Creek. And I just wanted to add to what Allison said, when you do change the stream 
uh, bed and the flow, as she said, it's pooling, you're going to change all the ecosystem there. Uh, when the silt covers those areas, the animals uh, can't exist there that did exist. It changes the whole ecosystem. So, uh, but we currently have uh, just recently sent a, a letter, um, a joint letter to Mayor Buckley and County Executive Pittman explaining that the conditions which we expressed concern about previously have persisted. And uh, after big rain events, there's still, as she showed you in the, in, as Allison showed you in the pictures, there's still a lot of damage and pollution runoff that's going into the park and consequently down and into the creek. And uh, as Allison also mentioned, um, the two si simultaneous activities that are going on affecting the water, as she mentioned, there are two stream restoration projects going on and the county is, as she said, spending over a million dollars, uh, $700,000 on one and, and possibly as much on the second one to, um, to uh, correct any, any kind of problem that's going. And the Caffrey Run um, project has been completed and it's working quite effectively. There is no um, sediment running off in, the, and the other one is on, the plans have been developed and uh, they're preparing to uh, start that. They haven't broken ground yet. And then at the same time, we have this um, large development going in park, with Parkside Preserve, which is doing just the opposite. It's creating a lot of um, documented sed sediment runoff. And um, it's been going on since the project started. And they did put in the uh, core log, but that's been breached and not doing any good at right now either. So unless the city and the county together uh, express concern about this, it's going to have lasting effects on the park and the ecosystems in the park. Um, these two offsetting activities of stream restoration and then stream decomposition, you know, are, um, it, it's wasteful and it's counterproductive and it, it's heartbreaking really. Uh, to see quiet waters and the rangers and how hard they work to uh, keep this park going um, every day, open every day for the people of the, well, not just the county, everybody to come. They get over a million visitors a year and then to see it all broken down and um, degraded by an adjacent project which uh, ironically is calling itself Parkside Preserve. So we uh, have uh, some concerns about this ongoing situation. Thank you. And I see your, the letter you're asking for four things. Yeah, in the letter that we uh, sent, you did get a copy of that. Immediately mm -hmm. issue stop work order to address the polluted runoff. Organize a meeting. Number two, schedule a follow-up meeting after the site walk to discuss is how the city county will coordinate restoration. Number three, initiate review to ascertain that the pertinent permits have been issued. Number four, work with the Rondo Rivers to design new storm, sorry, new city ordinances that will help prevent this. Thank you very much. I think we'll hit on some of these topics over the course of our conversation. Good, thank you. Any, sorry, any other questions for her, for the friends? Okay. Uh, is there anybody else who wanted to testify at this time? Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee for having me this evening. Matt Johnson, um, Executive Director for the Arundel Rivers Federation. Uh, my address is 1639 Chesapeake Lane, Edgewater, so I'm not a resident of Annapolis, but a protector of the South River. So this is near and dear to my heart. Um, in fact, I've visited the site many, many times, and what I think I want to say today, tonight is I've walked the downstream channel. That's what I want to emphasize tonight. Um, I could read you off um, quotes that you all know because you passed a resolution about the purpose of our sediment and erosion laws. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say in layman's terms, the purpose is to protect the downstream resources. So I want to talk a little bit about um, what we've all seen. We've all seen the muddy water pooling across this previously ephemeral drainage channel. Ephemeral means the water doesn't stay there after the, the, the summer thunderstorm. 
it goes away after the summer thunderstorm. It's still there. It was there yesterday. All right, muddy water all across the site. There is sediment debris piling up behind the core logs, which were placed there in the past. That is indicative of sediment moving through that channel. The grass and the leaves are, are or the, the grass is all um, laying down because floodwaters came through that channel during the last summer thunderstorm. So it's indicative that high quantities of water are coming through that channel as well. It's, it's undeniable that that channel is changing. So if the purpose of our sediment and erosion control laws are to protect these downstream resources, I guess that what I wanna to emphasize tonight is a request that we have a paradigm shift in the city and that we start inspecting the downstream resources. In the county over the last two years, we learned this lesson the hard way too. There were many sites, including the Hillsmere Elementary site, which I had to deal with with Jackie Guild in the city, and we had to negotiate how do we take care of the Hillsmere Elementary site on the county side. And what we came up with is we're going to start walking the downstream resources. Every time there's a complaint from a citizen, we don't just go on the site and make sure that, that there is daily cover on the site and that the sediment pond is doing well. We sent the county, this is back whenever I worked with the county executive, we uh, demanded that the county department of inspections and permits send the inspectors down the downstream channel to the point of the sediment problem and walk all the way back up. They now stake the channel so that they can monitor sediment erosion. And in the larger sites, they place trail cams so that they can monitor sediment and erosion. So in, in, in conclusion, or in summary, um, that channel is changing. It's changing dramatically, and we need a paradigm shift in the way that we inspect our construction sites. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Any questions for Mr. Johnson? All right, anybody else uh, here to testify? All right, so I'm gonna fast forward a bit before we turn it over to staff, to because I do have a section dealing with what they're talking about as far as the ephemeral stream, and as, as Mr. Johnson said, you know, ephemeral streams just flow seasonally with the groundwater. Um, and this is what we used to have before. This is pictures I took uh, 2011. You can see the timestamp back when I worked for the city, I was inspecting, walking this property for the permit review. And uh, you see ephemeral channel, blackened leaves, that's it. Um, because Ephemeral channels don't get a lot of flow, and so you don't get the material moving around. Black and leaves, because the water just sits on the leaves, the leaves don't move, and so that, that's, that's all it was. Um, so this just flows through the forest. In some places, you can barely even see it. It's not a high, great quality picture, but towards the back of it, you can see some of the blackened leaves. Uh, so that's what it used to look like. You can see that flag in the tree. Uh, this is right on the border as, so, as it enters into the park. Again, just keep that in mind. That's what it used to look like. Um, in terms of what it looks now, you see the sediment, sedimentation. You see the uh, material getting stopped up. And, and this is another picture. Um, again, you see the material washed away. The leaves washed away. It's washing away the topsoil. And zoomed in, you can see, same picture zoomed in. You can see how it's washing away the roots. Okay, this, this means it's not an ephemeral channel anymore. It's become an inter intermittent channel, which means it flows every time it rains. Um, this is erosion off-site. As, as uh, I think Mr. Um, Johnson said, you know, this is what our laws are designed to prevent. Another picture, again, just drastically different from what it should be. That's a zoomed in. You can see the channel starting to form. You can see sediment deposited from the work site. And as, when you're talking about the increased volume of water, look at all this material that's getting backed up coming through this system. And again, previously there wasn't enough water force to move a leaf. And now you have huge sticks material getting washed through that system. Just again, another before and after. Um, and just emphasizing the code, our own city code says purpose Chapter will help reduce the negative impacts of land development on water resources, maintain the integrity of streams and minimize damage to public and private property, 
Another section of it talks about during and after development, provisions shall be made to accommodate in an effective manner the increased water runoff caused by changes in soil and surface conditions, and to avoid siltation of receiving streams. Uh, I've shown pictures of siltation of receiving streams. MD Standards and Specifications Manual for Erosion Sediment Control talks about principles to follow. A3 talks about protecting and avoiding natural resources. And the stuff that's bold there, you can see every effort must be made to minimize impacts. Construction resulting in temporary impacts may require enhanced management. Um, talks about additional levels of control may be needed if it's a tier two water that has a TMDL, which, our, which the South River is, and I'm sure Mr. Johnson can confirm. Uh, number six in the principles is control or manage on-site, off-site runoff. Discharge velocities need to be controlled and minimize soil erosion. Um, stormwater management code 1710 purpose is to reduce effects of land use changes on stream channel erosion, maintain and assist the improvement of water quality. Under permits, there's a provision for revocation. If change in any site runoff characteristics upon which an approval or waiver was granted, or if there's an immediate danger to a downstream area. Um, I would certainly uh, state that it's an environmental emergency danger to the downstream area. And certainly the pictures seem to say that there's a change in site runoff condition characteristics. So I'm saying on that to, to, to find out from staff, what's your plan to address that? Aldrin Savage, um, I have also walked that stream. I, Matt walked it. Um, I walked it probably a year ago. I didn't see the damage you, you referenced. Uh, I have, I've seen the, the pictures. One of the maintenance supervisors sent it to me, uh, Tuesday, um, and what what we see, and and I know that that we all look at this uh, and say this is this is horrible, is is unfortunately the result of the soil conditions that they have on this site. The times I have walked a stream, I have not seen the sedimentation. I haven't walked it in probably six months. Um, I have ridden the, the pavilion trail a couple of times, uh, looking at, at the site. I have walked some of the, the dirt trails through there looking, um, and I am more than happy to, to walk this again, to, to look at it. Uh, but let me, let me step back and just kind of give the, uh, committee's kind of an overview of the site. Of, of what we are dealing, what the, what not what we are dealing with, and what the contractor is dealing with, and what the developer is dealing with. This site, unfortunately, falls into the the, the category that I call a frog. You know, it, a what? A frog. Frog. A frog. You know, when when I started work um, nearly fifty years ago, there was a lot of really good sites out there that you could develop. And they were the princes and the princesses. And now we've got a lot of the frogs out there. There are very few good sites. They're very difficult to develop. And this happens to be probably one of the worst to, to develop. Because this site was what, from what they are digging out of it, was an old rubble landfill. The, they are digging massive amounts of, of concrete, old trees, lousy soils and asphalt out of the sites and if you if you uh, if you look at some of the stockpiles you will see the the piles of of, of um, concrete and and asphalt out, out there and i know that both both you alderman savage and you alderman arnett saw those when we we walked the site in order to prepare the site for construction and for, for the development of the land. What the, what the contractor has been doing 
is working basically from west to east and has been excavating down, in some cases, 20 feet or more to remove this, this debris from the site to make the site suitable for building homes on. Because I, I think we can all agree what we don't want to see in 20 years are foundations that are failing or cracking because they were built on top of, of rubble. The result of that is he, he's been excavating in, in strips probably about, I'm going to say about 50 feet wide, and he's been excavating, removing all the material. The result of that is that he, um, he has to continually move his stockpiles around because as he cleans one area, he has to move his stockpiles so he can clean the next area. And then he has to take those stockpiles and he has to clean those, those stockpiles of debris, put them into, into piles so that they can be crushed or removed from the site. So it's been a very difficult process and it has prevented him from having what you would normally see on a, on a site, a single stockpile or single stockpile area. It is constantly in motion and it's constantly being graded and it's constantly being moved around all of, the, of these stockpiles. He has now reached the western side of the site and he is excavating at that location. What has, has occurred previously because of the concerns with, that were with, sed with the sediment leaving the site, and much of what you're seeing is not granular sediment, it's the color that you find in your clays and your colloidal suspensions is what we talk about what passes a 200 sieve, which means nothing to, to anybody, but it's, it's to a non-technical person. But if, you're, if, it's what, if you threw into a bottle and you shook it up, it just stays in suspension forever, and it, not forever and ever, but for a long time. And, and it looks horrible, but when you get down to the bottom, it's got very little actual material in it. When, when we started to have the problems about, I'm going to say a year ago, when, when these were brought to our attention, and we, ins we got with the contractor, and the contractor went into, the, into sediment pond number eight, which is the one that is on the west southwestern or southeastern corner of the, of the site. And that was designed as a structure that had a dewatering device in it. So the, the, the pond would fill up to a certain point, and then it would dewater from there, meaning it would flow out, out through the riser. And then when you got the major storms, it continued to, to, to flow out. Because this, this material was not settling, what the, the contractor, uh, what we, we had the contractor do was they further excavated the pond to provide more storage, both in depth as well as in, in size. And we removed this dewatering device to give us a little bit additional storage. What he then did was he installed a pumping system, which he pumped from sediment pond seven or sediment pond eight to sediment pond seven, and then he pumped it to the top of the hill to a, a sediment trap that wasn't being used. Uh, it wasn't being used because the grading hadn't occurred at that location yet. And he pumped it through a, um, a filter bag. And after he pumped it through the filter bag, he went through straw bales into the pond. And then, excuse me, to a great extent, it was it infiltrated into the soils. And so we were able to achieve just about a zero discharge from those two, from those two sediment traps. He also attempted to bring in a a mechanical device and a filter device to attempt to clean the water up through using that. It was a device that Cheney had come up with for removing some of the sediment from um, concrete water. That did not work very well. He then applied to uh, MDE, Maryland Department of the Environment, and got permission to install a flock to, to put flocculants into the sediment traps in an effort to cause these very fine pot particles to consolidate together and then settle out, which seemed to, to work relatively well uh, over time. It wasn't as instant as the, the uh, 
technical technical representative told us, but it did does seem to work. Unfortunately, when where we are where he is right now is he's on that last strip of material that he's digging out, and that strip is is a strip that is immediately downstream of the pond he was pumping into the the empty pond that was doing the infiltration um, and as he dug down what he began to see was water was coming through the face of the excavation indicating that if he continued to do this he was the the face of that excavation because it was a it was an it was an impoundment it was not a dam it was an impound it was a dug pond and he was concerned that what would then happen is that that face Mr. was. Mr. Bright, can I just interrupt. What, what are you trying to document right now? I'm what trying. I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to tell you how we got to where we are seeing in these pictures, right here. Okay. okay. And that, and I do want to get into that more, but uh, to, I want to let me re I, refocus you on this. Can, can I just off, can I, off site impacts right now? Can Can I just finish what I was saying? And it'll take me one more minute. Okay, so what he's gotten to at this point, he's going to no longer do that. He's pumping into his, he's now, we're catching everything in traps seven and eight. He's increased his flocculent placed in there. And what he, is, he tries to do is he tries to pump this down, basically clear water out of that, out of that site, going through a, a filter bag as well as, as other materials. Because we have now had this series of rainfall events, it is continually redisturbing the site or redisturbing the ponds, and it, we are now when he when it the pond stays full, and so we have another storm. It washes out and it goes downstream, yeah, which is very unfortunate. But he is making the best effort he can. He's come not up making with. the best effort. I've I've went out and I'll document this too, but I'll, I want to get to the stream first. But I've gone on two occasions over the past three weeks and noticed uh, 18, 15, 18 violations each time I've been out there. And some of them, the inspector tells them to do, and the next inspection, they weren't even resolved. There are things they could be doing, such as stabilizing, as I've asked for repeatedly for about over a year now, stabilizing heavy-use travel lanes, stabilizing heavy-use stockpile, I'm sorry, uh, uh, staging areas. Right, this is required in the, in, in the MDE standards, and I pointed that out repeatedly, and it's not been done. There are things like stabilizing portions of the stockpile, which has not been done. Right, there's inlet protection, which we've told them about repeatedly, have not and, been and, done. And there's sweeping in the road that has not been done. And I know this was pointed out last time MD was out in January, whenever they came out the last time, which was, and this is the point I was saying before, is that the city and the developer are fixated on the sediment traps. But as it says in the standards, they are your last line of defense. And you have to make efforts to prevent and stabilize, prevent that water getting into the trap, prevent it from picking up the sediment. And the only way you do that is through stabilization. And I've pointed out repeatedly, just tell them to put down aggregate and mulch on these travel lanes, right? And they haven't, and, and the city has not been willing to tell them to do that. And MD made that point saying, yes, the traps are last line, you need to look the rest of the upstream at the rest of the site. And that's, you know, I'll get into that more, but that's what I'm frustrated about. One of the things and, is that, and, and, and but that's, I, I don't want to go down that too much. I want to refocus on the stream because I'm hearing from you. You're saying that uh, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of hesitancy and, and frankly ex excuses. You're talking about how this used to be a rubble landfill. And yes, the area that was an open field was a rubble landfill. You can see the grade dropped off by about three, four feet. But these pictures, like the, the rubble landfill, if you look at these pictures, are to the left, right? These pictures are an ephemeral stream that were not part of that landfill. That's that. Yes, they're the stream that's downstream going through. They're, they're the drainage way going downstream of this of this uh, of this site. They're they're the subservient land below this site. What about the subservient land below? That side? they are the, the Quiet Waters Park is lower than this site, and so that's where everything drains to, and it drains through the natural drainage ways that are there. And why? Why are you saying that? Because What's you point? you reference these streams, and that that it was it seemed to be a built up area, and so 
It's the lower property. It's you, you, and what's your point? With I, that? That's where the water goes. Okay. okay. So what, what is, so you're citing common law when we have law that supersedes common law. We have I point out all these code references from our sediment control grading plan, Maryland MDE details, stormwater ma manual of Maryland that says you need to be preventing the pollution and sedimentation of the receiving waterways. And you're saying, oh, it's the fact that they're downhill? No, I'm saying what? that they are making they are making every effort. They're making a good effort to try to prevent this this erosion. They've got issues that are are created because of what they have to do to build this to build this development to excavate out all of this rubble that's in here so that we can so that the development can be built more houses can be provided to this to that to that's, our that's, excu that's the excuses sam instead of just going out there and saying and again maybe i guess i have to go back and point out the fact that the city inspector has not been pointing out this stabilization requirements, the MD standards and specifications, all these violations, all these fines, and you're telling me that they're doing Alderman, everything they can. We were out there yesterday with the yesterday. Yes, yesterday with the MDE inspector. Okay, the MDA, MDE inspector looked at the site. We we discussed. And, and we, meaning the contractor, discussed the issues with the site. She, he showed her what they were doing. He explained the problems with the stockpiles. The MDA inspector said to us, as we said, what, how do you see this site? Is the site in compliance? She said, no, it has some minor, minimal, issues associated with it. We were out there two weeks ago with MDE looking at the flocculant because MDE, this was one of the first sites they were able to see with the flocculant being used. They told us that the city is doing a good job doing this. So, okay? so, so you're they're, saying they're, they're doing everything they can. And so you're saying this, there's nothing else that can be done to address, I mean, you, I'm not even sure from what I'm hearing that you think this is an issue. I mean, you're saying, you're talking about the fine sedimentation, but if you zoom in on these pictures, that's not fine clay. That is large sediment that is washing off from the project site. Rob, you've seen it. I've gone out there downstream. I have not seen it. I will, the, when I walked the site a year ago, and that was when I walked to well, do you see? Do you see it now? Look at these pictures. Do you see I it now? See what, what I see in these pictures that we just received is I see a lot of color that is in, in that water. Now, color in the water is a problem. Now this this There's no water in this picture. Do you see the erosion right here? I see, yes, I see erosion there. I need. To, I would want to see that in the field and not just by photograph to see exactly how it relates. Okay, and, and when I first told Public Works about this three weeks ago, and you're telling me nobody's, you haven't looked out and Rob, been out I to have, the project site? Rob, I have not walked that. Okay, I have not walked that in the past, and assuming that's part of what I, I, I walked. I have not walked that in the past, I'm going to probably say six months. Okay, I, mean, so, so I walked that previously. I have not walked that in the past six months. Matt walked it previous to when I, I gave it. public works that I told you this was going to be discussed I've been telling and, and nobody's been able to go out there to look to verify to get because I, I mean that's I mean I get what I want to get at is is you're an engineer but what I'm hearing from you is that there's nothing else that can be done to meet the code requirements that are listed here are you telling me there's nothing else that could be Rob, done to I'm, reduce the runoff? I'm, Rob, I'm, Volume. I'm, excuse me, uh, uh, that was inappropriate on my okay. part. Alderman, I'm saying that they are doing the best they can do out there. Do I agree with you that you ought to, they, they could do some more um, mulching out there, some more stabilization? Well, I'm not, I'm not out talking there. about that. I'm talking about volume at this point. 
There's nothing. Like, you're telling me there's nothing else they could do. You're an engineer. There's always an engineering solution, right? Rob. Right. I'm, I'm so, again. I apologize. Alderman Savage. Can they? Can they do something? Could they do something out there to cut back on the volume of water? With a, with a significant redesign, they could probably change the, the characteristical flows of the water. But, you know, you also know, as I know, that sediment control is not designed to handle some of these higher flows. It's, you know, I know, we, but we these know higher that. flows, I'm sorry, Mr. Bryce, the, the whole... These higher flows were not there before. I showed these pictures of the lead, the femoral channel. Those leaves were not moving. Now it's changed. The hydrology has changed, and that is something the, the, that is not allowed under the, the code. The hydrology, the storm. Remember, stormwater management and sediment erosion control are kind of two different animals. Stormwater management is a is is a term of art, just as, as sediment erosion control is a term of art, and it relates to the post-development conditions. The unfortunate thing is that, or the, I don't want to say the unfortunate, I'm just going to say it as a matter of, fact, of, of, of truth, is that your developed condition, your, or your development condition, the condition that they are under right now, where they are, they have bare ground, they have ground that they are great, actively grading, they have ground where they are actively installing utilities. They have the stockpiling is probably hydrologically your worst condition. That is where you have more runoff than you will have under the developed condition. And part of that is because you actually have the stormwater management controls in at that point. But in addition to that, as, as you have, have ref referred or, or stated, excuse me, the 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 uh, houses are in. It is now stabilized with grass. You get some infiltration. Excuse me. Part of it. Part part of it. Stabilized with grass. You get some infiltration through the grass. You have your your sediment not your sediment, your stormwater management control devices in. There's they are reducing the the flow, uh, and they are are. Are designed to do that. Most of those are designed also to, to um, reduce your flows and, and to um, drain out within about 72 hours. But when you have the storms like you're having right now, where we are looking at these storms that are coming through as frequently as they are are coming through. The devices fill up, which you could also have doesn't, with your stormwater management systems. Yes. It doesn't they that fill tell up that they and they overflow to, at a higher rate. But doesn't that tell you that they need to that they need to revise and review their approved stormwater plan? I mean, uh, we no, are having no, a changing weather. No, no that does climate. not that does not tell me that because what we have are we have standards that have been promulgated by MDE. And I have watched those standards for my career, and they have changed continually trying to better mimic what they, they want. I've watched the two-year storm blow out, st at, out streams, the infiltration fail miserably, and, and we are now beginning, to, we're now looking at this environmental site design, which is, is, is actually, I think, one of the best things we have seen, because it, it gets away from these major... It, so facilities We're, we need to get back i need to open this up to the rest of the committee too uh but what i'm hearing is that this change this alteration to the hydrology of this receiving stream at the time i know you haven't walked it at the time is i'm hearing no concern from public works that this is the when, case when when i pointed I, out in our code that our code prohibits this change in the receiving stream this erosion in the receiving alderman, stream. alderman i am more than happy to walk it again and take a look at it. I'm more than happy to do that. Alderman Savage, I, I, can I say something here? So I earlier today I had a meeting with Public Works and um, what Mr. Bryce hasn't, hasn't had a chance to get to yet is that consistent with MDE as instructed, reliable, like if something's not working, that doesn't mean you just quit. 
you come up with another solution. So the other solution that Reliable is working on because sediment trap eight is being overwhelmed, you know, several times over, um, pretty regularly now. Um, there, there was a sediment trap that they were pump, Reliable was pumping to upstream further in the development um, previously, but that sediment trap was taken out of commission um, for a period of time. It is because of where they were working on the site. Now that site, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Bryce, is being re-excavated and put back into service, but it will not, so that you can now again, will be again able to pump from sediment trap eight up to that other sediment trap and, and lower the level in sediment trap eight so that it can handle storm conditions. But that's going to take a few weeks to accomplish. Like several more weeks because ag good. again, they were down 20 feet with this excavation and they have to bring it back up, compact it so that you can, you, you can utilize it. Yeah, that, and that's, that's good to hear. That's, that's a solution, right? That's an, an idea, it's something more they can do when I'm trying to change this mentality of, of why am I not hearing this from Public Works as far as let's look at what else we can do on the site. So, I mean, there are a couple of things that I think need to be done, which if I need to do a resolution, I'll, I'll do that. Um, clearly, in my mind, these pictures show that our code is, this project's in violation of our code. Receiving waters cannot have this erosion happening during construction or post-construction. One thing I really want done is a review of the stormwater management plan. Because now is the time. If we wait until everything's built, it's going to be too late to get revisions. Maybe they need to more. Maybe they need to provide more quantity control because right now, the problem's not water. Well, the problem's always going to be water quality. But the big problem with this femoral channel is quantity. It's washing. It's causing that erosion. So maybe we need more quantity control, which means we may need to get that plan revised. But I'm not hearing Public Works even considering Al that Al right now. Alderman Savage, this is a big drainage area. Okay, I'm going to be very, you know, it is a big drainage area. And I think one of the, you know, looking, you know, the, the photos we've seen are at the, at the twin 42 by 27 inch cul culvert under the maintenance road. That's oh, a big drainage no, area. No, no, that is from the path through quiet waters, which is one single culvert. And that it directly only drains the project site. Alderman, that's the that is what you're seeing at the bottom of this. We don't need to argue. I've got, even if you're right, I have pictures from the regular culvert. The point is that muddy water, that runoff, it's not a huge drainage area. I'm I'm hearing more excuses. I'm not uh, giving you any um, excuses, Alderman. It is, I, you're saying it's the larger drainage area when that's not I the problem. I went back because of the concerns that I've heard from you and from quiet orders and the pictures that the 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 uh, maintenance supervisor showed me of of what was going on i went back and i got the plans for quiet orders to look at this culvert specifically to see what was there and also look at the trail okay what is the, the, the trail has got some tiny culverts like What's, what's your my, what's my point is it's a big drainage area coming through there but apparently it wasn't big enough to erode the femoral channel until now that's because of a change in hydrology because of the project it's the same size it was Ald before alderman right? I will, the only thing that's different is the development project Ald alderman i will go back and i will ask mike rossberg to look back at the comps that they presented to see if there's any defect in the comps to see to ensure that what those computations show is that the pre and post development runoff characteristics are the same thank you i will i will that do is, that that okay? is good but i think you also need to show them these pictures to say regardless of what the calculations show we are seeing physical evidence of the of it's not emulating pre-development conditions well but it's not in the stormwater management mode yet but it, it is, is i just pointing in, to the md standards in, for sediment and erosion control the standards say 
that you cannot, it's temporary impacts may require enhanced management and that these resource, impacts these resources must be avoided. And if we, we will take a look at it. Okay. And, um, and I other, think what our, our hope is as we go through this process, as we finish, try to finish out this, out this development, I say we try to finish out this development because, you know, it's, it's in the city. You know, the, the hope is that within the next, I think, six to eight weeks, they will be able to finish out this excavation, start to get rid of the stockpiles, get the roads in, get okay. the, this portion of the site stabilized, just like the first section of the pipe and that's, is and that's stabilized. Good. And that's, that's what our, you know, our big goal what the big goal here is, is so have to get, get us two, out of this mess that we're in. I agree, but the other two, make sure we, we also want to make sure we're not going to be having this erosion continue into the final storm once like, things like, are built. Like, and here are like, the two things that have come out of this, right? One is you need, we need to look at if the permit needs to be suspended to review all of this. Does, because we have in here in the city code changes to any site runoff characteristics upon which approval was granted. Um, so I think that provision needs to be looked at to say, um, uh, look, suspend the permit so we can actually do a, a review of things to see if, how, if it needs to be changed to I, provide for more quantity. I, I, I would suggest, because I think we have to look at this in a little, in, in, a little different time frame. Let me let me let me say it. Let me phrase it that way. Well, you're okay. saying we only have a okay. few weeks left. Okay, we've got we've got a couple couple three weeks left to get up to. We're we're we are figuring on a couple to three weeks left to bring this last lift up, so that they can return to pumping to the the upper okay. sediment control. Have track. you looked at remediation? Because I'm again these pictures. Alderman, as as I said, I have not walked that stream recently. I have ridden the trail. I have not walked okay. the stream. I am more than happy to rewalk that stream. I will set okay? something up for next week. Yeah. Um, I want to turn this over back. Uh, my colleagues are probably impatient with me at this point. Any uh, questions from the committee on this particular topic of the stream? Your, your mic's not on. Your mic's not on. Your mic's off. Mine? Mine? I, I, yeah. can, you can't hear me? You can't hear me? <laughs> no, his lips were moving. No, That's Sheila, your, your mic Sheila, isn't your on. Mic isn't on. I, I know, because I wasn't being recognized. You oh. were. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, uh, so uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. I'm, Chair hearing I'm hearing a couple things. One, one there, is no there is no plan to change anything. To change Two, uh, Mr. Bryce, uh, Mr. Is, speaking Bryce is speaking to us, to us without having without walked having the site walked for six, site months, for six months, which I would which submit should have been should walked, have been and, walked. Either and either that or we get somebody, we get somebody who has who walked has the site. Alderman, you misunderstood me. I walked the site yesterday. Okay, I walked the site three weeks ago. I have not walked the stream in three to six months. That's what I have not done. I have been all over the actual construction site. You know, it, the, the issue is very bluntly is that I'm just about 70 years old. And my deciding I'm going to go walk in the woods anymore alone is not something I, my wife is very happy with. So, you know, I haven't walked it because I will be honest, I do not feel sometimes I am that stable on my feet. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I'm 79, I'm 79 years, years old and I did walk and it. I did walk. And uh, yeah, that's fine. That's if you fine. can't do it, then somebody else somebody should else do it. Should but do it. I but think I what we're but hearing but is we're not going to do anything until the project until is completed, completed. and at which is, time it which will time clear, itself clear itself up because it will no longer be an issue. 
Well, that's that what, it sounds, what like I, it sounds like to me. That's not what I, I said. I will, I will walk the stream bottom again, and I will take a look at it. I am not opposed to doing that. I will, you know, drag someone along with me to do it. I have been on the site, as I said, I, I've been on the site frequently. I just walked it two days ago. I walked it three weeks three weeks ago. So we've been on the site. We've been looking at the problems, trying to address them. I will have Mike Rosberg go back and recheck the calculations to see if he is in concurrence with what Matt checked when Matt was here, because he did the, the checking of those those calculations. I am, you know, I am more than happy to do those things to give the the committee more comfort in in this. I do not think that there's there is a problem with the computations. I think we're going to find that the computations hold hold up. You know, again, we I will take another look at at this. I'll rewalk the stream. I did not see it the times I've walked it. You know, they, we've, Mr. We've, Chair, Mr. I, I Chair, think we're beyond the beyond point of computations. computations. Unless there, there seems to be two, two alternate sets, alternate of, facts sets of facts here. The, the, the photographs, photographs that, I that I see and that the, and county, the county showed us show, this, show that there is that permanent, there is permanent damage, damage, and damage and change because of the flows off, of the, off of the site. Either that's true, either or, that's it's true, or, that's true or it's not. And if it's and true, if it's then true, we've got to stop gotta doing stop what we're doing, doing, doing until we can until stop we that stop from, that happening. from happening. It's not it's we'll not walk it in a week or two and get back together. We've been doing that for months. We've been getting back together time after time after time. Time, time, and we're and not changing, we're not the, changing outcome the outcome at all. at all. Well, that, that's where really a large question here with this. Are we going to ask gonna for ask a stop until we have some we more permanent change? Or where are we going? Because we're, going we're going hearing the same songs same over and over again. Over well, do we need to do something like we did with Rocky Gorge? I mean, I, I would, at this point, I do think the council needs to introduce a resolution that is going to be uh, ordering a stop work order, um, but also a, a review of the stormwater management plan and, and also a, a development of a remediation plan uh, for the stream leaving the property. Um, because Mr. Chair, may, may I ask yes. a question? How did we address the uh, the potential stop work order? What was it a month ago when there was discussion about a stop work order? I didn't remember that there was a resolution introduced then. Oh, oh. Um, Do you know what I'm talking about? The one pertaining to this project? Yeah, yeah. I don't. I mean, you went out. Um, I thought there was a movement to. We, we do have a resolution, which I, I need to. I know we're past time, but I, I guess just to fast forward because it's kind of related. Um, well, to back up because we do need to figure out what's going to happen at this point. Um, I'm that, not that was feeling just frame of reference. Yeah. I, um, I think we did issue a stop work order, and we had intensive work for a couple of days by the contractor, and things were brought up to par, at least for those issues. But this issue, with the water, continual sediment-filled water going into the park, is has not been addressed clearly. And talking and about them talking doing 50-foot wide, wide, wide strips or moving or their moving piles their around piles doesn't speak, doesn't to, the speak to the real issue. issue. David Gerald David said, said any sediment escaping from the project is unacceptable. is unacceptable. And you stop work and issue fines until it's mediated. And we're not doing that. Well, the council said that too. You're absolutely right. I mean, the council said that too. Um, and I, I want to go back because I need to make some points to get to this larger point. Um, I mentioned already, I, 
when I inspected the site on 618, um, I emailed the city 621 with 18 different deficiencies and violations, uh, reference city code, MD standards, and um, that in itself was a surprise because as uh, the committee is frustrated because we've had these conversations with the former director, thought they were resolved, the site looked great, and, but then you know I went out after I got more pictures and found 18 violations. Um, even with the new protocol, new inspection checklists, more frequent inspections, still had violations out there. So do we know, does the department know yet why that's, why that happened? Well, we are issuing citations in the last, uh, citations have been issued June 3rd, June 23rd, and two on Monday. Yes. Um, you know, and our inspector goes out and he gives field correction notices. Uh, they take action and then something else happens and there's another violation and we that's when we issue the citations. But on the 18th, again, 18 violations found on this project site. And my, so looking at this, so, I, so just to clarify timeline, I emailed this to staff on the 21st. And the inspector was out on the 21st. I, he hadn't seen my report because I sent it afterwards. And he noted all ESC passed. And you got it up on the screen, all ESC passed. So out of the 18, even if you want to argue some about some of the 18 things I noticed, he noticed zero. How could that happen? I can't explain that. Well, has, has Public Works looked at this, why that happened and what can be done to correct it? Because he's missing violations. Alderman, so our inspector goes out and looks at it. He looks at what he looks at what you have sent in. He compares what you have sent in with what he is finding on the site. He issues field correction notices for what he finds because he is the inspector. But I shouldn't so, be having to tell him this. These issues were out here, and he he said oh, everything passed. So has the department looked at this to figure out what's going on, why this happened? And what can be done to fix it? We have begun to issue increasing citations as... But that, that doesn't get to the fact that the inspector's not noticing violations. What Do you acknowledge that? No, I don't acknowledge You don't? That. I acknowledge that you find violations and they're violations that he does not find. And his, what you are, are finding are in some cases, and not all cases, but in some cases are fairly minor issues. Now, so you're saying they, they shouldn't be resolved even if they're minor? They should be resolved. I cannot answer the question why some of them are not resolved. Where's the management I had, here? I had, I went, when I went out there a couple days, a couple days ago, we went through some of your, your concerns about that they needed to correct. We also went through some concerns that I found that they needed to correct. Okay. The, the, the inspector is out there two times a week inspecting it. They have their inspector out there doing the same, doing the same but, thing. And they, Pretty they, much the ones that, that our inspector is finding is the same ones that their inspector is finding. There is an effort to, to bring this under, under control. It, but I'm, not, I'm still not hearing about how, I mean, look at, so again, the 21st, they said everything passed. And then after the inspector saw my list of comments, they issued a field correction notice that had seven things to correct, right? But that was only after I went out and pointed these out for the staff. I, again, I shouldn't have to do that. Why, why, what has been done to resolve this situation that we are facing again? And the silence is definitely. We, we have, we have, again, we have increased the, the uh, we've increased the, the citations. We have. But that doesn't have to do with what, that doesn't have to do, the staff is not noticing 
saying you need to fix things, even if they're minor, that are deficiencies. I've pointed out and cited city code, state code that require these things, such as, again, stabilization of travel lanes. And I have to deal with all the public complaints about dust flying off the site because they're not stabilizing travel lanes. That's just an example. And then the inspector noted those things to be corrected. So they must have at some point acknowledged that they're problems. But what's been, is anything being done to like uh, training or uh, anything to make sure this doesn't happen again? Because we've been dealing with it for two years. I mean, the answer I'm hearing is I, no. I don't, I don't have an answer for you, Alderman. If, if what's going to have to happen why is... Do, I, why, do I, we even, why do I even sit here? We've got this in the law and the code, and I've sent these complaints for a year and a half now, and I, I mean, I'm hearing that there's no plan in public works to help make sure that these violations are picked up. No, no additional training, guidance, uh, bring out other agencies. I mean, you had MD, uh, at least they acknowledged there were some deficiencies. Because what's, what the, the consequence is we're having more and more pollution go into the park for the past two years, which are entirely preventable if our code was followed. I mean, and it gets, long, it gets even worse because you've got this fuel correction notice, which says, gave them three days to fix things, which brings me to, and also note this three, five, six, and seven issues I've listed, which brings me to the, um, the resolution we passed which specifically says that, let's see, where is it? It says the fuel correction notices shall require corrections within 24 hours. Uh, it requires that daily multiple fines should be issued for site noncompliance. And I understand you're issuing fines and that's good, but looking at the pile of fines you gave me, it's only for offsite discharge of sedimentation. No fine, well maybe one I think was God point out to be, but no fines for the most part have been issued for site non-compliance. So, and there have been non-compliance issues that when I mentioned with the inspector, inspector finally noted they have to stabilize the staging area. Unfortunately, didn't mention the travel lanes. But then in the next fuel correction notice from the, oh, I guess I don't have it on here, from the inspector noted the same issue from the contractor and that was in July. So the contractor's not even listening to the orders given by the staff and there's no escalation of, of enforcement, no fines for having your site non-compliance, no stop work order. Alderman, no sites are in compliance. There's no such thing as a construction site that's in compliance. What? <laughs> is it one of the most absurd things I've that heard. That is not man. the most absurd to, thing. You there know I did no, this for seven years. I did this are section no on that, 10 years. no sites that are in compliance. Sorry? There are no sites that are 100% in compliance. Sorry, that's absurd. When we walked the site, that was in 99% compliance after we raised a, a, an S storm and everything was resolved and stabilized. I had pointed out one issue to the contractor. That was a site in compliance. But a site with 18 violations is not in compliance. I mean, you can even look at things from this week. I mean, and because this is another example of, you know, all these inspection findings from July and June, you see all the highlighted partial, partial findings. And there are pass, and pass presumably is compliance. One fail. Another thing we put in the resolution was um, there should be no findings of partial. It should all just be pass or fail because if they're not complying with the standard, that's a failure because the code says they have to comply every single day with these standards, and they're not. Mr. Um, Chair. Mr. Chair, yes. What, I, what, I'm, what hearing hearing I'm hearing is two very different, two very different pictures and pictures views. And views. Uh, it almost, it sounds, almost like sounds like the county, the county finding things, things wrong, wrong and, and the MD, MD finding MD something wrong, wrong, and we finding and we some find things wrong, wrong, are largely, largely discounted by public works, by and, public works and no and site is no in compliance. Oh, my God. So let's just not do any of this. Alderman, it's the just, person, it's mind -boggling. Alderman, the person who told me no site was in compliance was a member of MDE. That so the, 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 the let's, just, let's just because quit the pretense, the pretense of doing this. We'll, doing we'll let the contractor we'll finish. finish. We'll do the same well, thing I when we get to Christmas spring. I mean, I, I disagree with you, Alderman. We, we, we fight 
the battle every day to protect our environment, whether you, ex you accept that or not, okay? Construction sites are very, very difficult to manage, keeping, and they are, and the contractor is doing a, a, a good job out there. That is, that is the report we continually see. Now, if we've got an erosion problem downstream, I am more than happy to go walk that again and look at it. The times I have walked it, I have not seen that as a problem. All right. The, the, I, I, I don't know what else to put in the code that would be any clearer. I have people saying, Rob, you need to pass new laws, prevent this. Well, it's in the code already that they have to comply with our standards of MD standards and specifications. And I'm hearing all these excuses. Well, that sites, no sites in compliance, uh, Rob. And as, as I said, Alderman, that was not what, that is not my words. That was the words that I got. You from, are repeating them to me. I am repeating them to you. What someone, I don't from care MD who said East, it. You are repeating it to me. And I am repeating to you what was said to me. So what's that mean? Um, with that? What are we supposed to do? Lower our standards? No, we're um, not supposed to lower our standards. Not supposed to do anything? We're, like, what does that mean? We're to, we're to apply the standards and, and do the best, and do the best possible to, to prevent sediment from leaving the site and degradating downstream. Do you think we are doing the best possible? I think under the conditions for what we are seeing within the site, I think they are, we are doing the best possible. Do we have some, pro some minor problems out on, on, on uh, um, Annapolis Neck Road? Yes. You brought up a couple of problems. I brought up a couple of problems when I was out there. Yes when I was out there. So minor problems, all the mud running off, which could be prevented and reduced. If they would follow all the minor things upstream. I mean, look at, look at the inspection practices. This is from 2013 to 19. Back, well, frankly, I think when I was doing the job, we had average 24, 18 stop work orders, third line down, 24 stop work orders, 18, and then it dropped precipitously to four, four, zero, one, one, one. The use of stop work orders has dropped off precipitously. And that's if, one thing we it, also have noted uh, in that resolution, which council passed, is not being adhered to. Um, that is one thing I want to touch on. Like, wh why is that? Why is the resolution not being adhered to? I was told, I think, by you, uh, Director Patrick, that there'd be some kind of staff meeting to talk about the resolution. We have had a staff meeting and <clears throat> I am acting director. I, I'm officially assistant director, and I'm acting director temporarily until um, <clears throat> our new director starts again. Um, so I had to come up to speed on this. Uh, I'll be honest. That was something Director Johnson um, handled. So we, we had a meeting um, and have reviewed your, uh, your resolution and some draft... I believe these are draft, um, the, the protocols, which uh, it sounds like you're aware of, um, were created by Director Johnson for uh, tier one projects, which are less than one acre in size, and a tier two projects that are more than one acre in size. Um, we are complying with these. You said you are? Um, the protocols. What absolutely. about the resolution? We are, the, your resolution, the, the protocols are, were established in order to follow your resolution. Um, and it, it, we have uh, protocols of how, well, first of all, a third party inspector has to be um, in place and paid for by the developer on any project over one acre. And that's what EQR is doing. Uh, for the Parkside Preserve site, um, and our inspector, um, and and they do in inspections, and our inspector visits those sites at a minimum twice 
per week, uh, often, more often. But what's, what's the use of doing more inspections if they're not picking up on the violations and deficiencies? He does pick up on violations and I've just shown you one instance. I can show you another if you'd like. Of Vince, this is where he's not picking up on the violations out there. I, I understand that your assessment and his assessment are not the same, and I well, haven't I, had time okay, to dive in. It's not a matter of not being the same. I notice a number, he notices zero. I notice 18. He goes out after seeing mine and says, okay, yes, I noticed there are 10 issues now all of a sudden, which tells me that all of my 18 issues were not just nothing, right? And that tells me there's somehow, we only have five minutes left. We're gonna to have to revisit this. I need to make the point though, not in compliance with that resolution. The resolution talks about stop work orders issued for offsite discharges. When's the last time a stop work order was issued on this project? I have not issued one. I'm not aware of the previous one. I don't think we've issued a issued. stop work order since the, uh, probably since we, I, I believe we issued one back in the fall. In the fall. And have, we've had plenty of offsite discharges because I had the whole pile of fines that have been issued to the contractor for offsite discharges, yet no stop work order issued. Number two is required on the resolution. Um, stop work order is issued a fuel correction notice is not adhered to. One of the fuel correction notices I mentioned here from June was not adhered to by the contractor as far as stabilizing staging areas and inlet repair yet no stop work order was issued by the uh, inspector. Number three, emphasizes utilization of stop work orders, and again, not used at all, except for since the fall, I guess. Number four, if site is out of compliance with any provisions, any provisions of chapter 1708, it should be a failed inspection. I just showed you that a picture of all these partial inspection findings, so this is clearly not being complied with. We've got number five, daily multiple fines issued for site noncompliance. Again, no fines have been issued for site non-compliance, so this is not being followed. Fast forward to number nine, fuel correction notice shall require corrections within 24 hours. Fuel correction notices, I've, well, the one I showed, the other one you gave to me, both had greater than 24 hour correction periods, not in compliance with the resolution. Number 10, grading permit suspension revocation, when there are repeated violations, has not been done. So that's 10, I could probably go through the others too, but I think my point is it's not in compliance. And, and that's a resolution passed unanimously by the council back in February. These things have been going on and on. So what is the plan to finally comply with resolution? Is it simply this protocol? But I mean, you're telling me the protocol has already been followed, but clearly it's not if these is, this is what's happening. So where do we go from here? We will take another look at it. Uh, that's all I can offer you right now. I've okay. just stepped into this recently, and um, and when we're fully staffed, I think it will be a lot easier for one thing. Well, we have we have groups to help. I know they're expensive, but we have Green Vest contractor who's experienced with this. They can step in and help. We have the county who I'm positive 100% would help if we asked their assistance watershed associations who would help but instead we're letting things go to hell i can't be more frank with this is like pollution happening over and over and over again and i'm trying to prove it's entirely preventable and at least you can reduce the severity of it but i'm hearing no sense of urgency about how this is in clear violation of our city code i'm hearing just a lot of uh, Excuses, I haven't been out to the site, or oh, it's a landfill, or it's large pieces of, it's small siltation of the stream, and we can't use this provision. Well, why the hell is the provision in there if we can't use it? Um, I just don't know what else to do. I'm frustrated. Uh, people are telling me you need to do more, but I'm past laws, and they're not being followed like this resolution. We're going back to Rocky Gorge, we passed all those legislation is not being followed. So what the hell do we do? Should we just resign at this point? I don't know. I'm done. Uh, anything else from the committee before we? Mr. Chair, I'll make a mm -mm. If there's no other business, Mr. Chair, I'll no. make a motion that we adjourn. Second. 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 All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Ah. <sighs>